everybody. Thank you all for coming. Um, we have a big group here today. Uh, we're going to be talking about the new Spears and Munzel disc um, and a few other things uh, like Dolby Vision, HDR10+, Plus, some grading. Uh, we're actually going to start with that kind of stuff. Uh, FOMO's here, but not for long. Um, <laughs> but, Sounds uh, good, Brett. Go. I love it. <laughs> He's going to be missing out. I will. Um, yeah, yeah, it's just going to go in a circle. I guess start with Don. Uh, if you want to introduce yourself, what you do. I am Don Munsell. I am half of Spears and Munsell. Um, Stacy and I, it's very hard to, to pick out exactly, you know, it's not like we have clearly defined roles in Spears and Munsell. Other than Stacy has vision and I'm, I've got more background in color theory and more coding. So I write most of the code. Um, the two of us work out, you know, what, what kind of patterns we're going to do and how we're going to build them. And um, I tend to, you know, write the actual code. And then Stacy is, uh, does the encoding, does color grading. He obviously, uh, he, he does, he shoots a lot of the uh, video that when we need live video, uh, things like that. And so that's what I do. I'm Stacy. I'm the other half. I guess you could say I'm the jobs to the Wozniak. Don is the Wozniak. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, that's, I mean, a lot of times I will come up and say, you know what, I want to do this. And then I crack the whip and I tell Don how I want him to jump and he jumps. <laughs> uh, and then I tell him, yeah, we could do that, but it'd be dumb. <laughs> But then he eventually comes around. I and usually if, do, in fact. Right. And if he doesn't, then we have two different versions of the pattern. So. Mm. All right. And David? Oh, Everybody knows I'm FOMO. <laughs> <laughs> well, hi. Uh, I'm uh, David McKenzie. I run a company called Fidelity in Motion, and we uh, specialize in uh, maximizing the quality of video compression uh, and authoring for the optical disc formats. Um, for Spears and Munsell, for the last version, the 2019 version, and also for the 2023 version we're talking about today. Uh, I'm the guy who uh, did all the programming, uh, designed the menus, um, linked it all together, and uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. All right. So we're going to, like I said, start with um, talking about Dolby Vision. So if anyone has questions regarding Dolby Vision, now's your chance. You know, when you a lot of people think HDR10 is better most of the time. Um, you know, a lot of that depends on the TV, what you're watching and whatnot. But if you have those kind of questions, let us know now. Um, but yeah, so I know me and FOMO have been doing a lot of testing between Dolby Vision, HDR10, HDR10 Plus, uh, using a variety of content. Uh, I think what a lot of people don't realize, um, HDR10 Plus and Dolby Vision doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be better or brighter. And in fact, when the content is graded to go beyond the capabilities of a display, its job is to darken that content so that the detail is visible. Um, so when you are seeing something in HDR10 that's brighter than Dolby Vision or HDR10+, Plus, um, that's down to tone mapping. It's down to the way the display is calibrated or not calibrated um, and various other factors. Uh, but I know uh, talking with Stacy, um, Generally speaking, if everything's calibrated properly and at the right levels, there really shouldn't be a luminance difference with Dolby Vision, right? There, I mean, I, we can talk about that a bit, but mm -hmm. so you asked earlier about, you know, how does, how, how do you grade Dolby Vision? How do you grade mm -hmm. HDR10? Well, you don't really grade for either format, you just grade HDR. So you have mm -hmm. a mastering display that has some capability. Uh, for Dolby Vision, if you've got access to a Pulsar, which is the display they had built to actually demonstrate HDR in the beginning, uh, it's capable of 4,000 nits. That's in a 10% window. I think we measured the one we measured was 4,400 nits in a 10% window at about 3,000 nits full screen. So you do, and then some people also use like the Sony BVM and do 1,000 nit Dolby Vision. So there really is no rules. But if, in the beginning, you grade your HDR content to be as is. And then if you're doing Dolby Vision, which is really a delivery format, then you might do the trim pass. And I, to me, trim pass is sort of the uh, killer feature of Dolby Vision. So you grade at 4,000 nits, but nobody has that today. So obviously, a customer is going to watch it on a lower capability display. And so Dolby created uh, specific predefined uh, trim pass levels 
600 nits is, the, well, first you do a 100 nit, which is really for SDR. Then you do a 600 nit, and they chose 600 nit because that's the capability of the Dolby PRM, which is the standard dynamic range grading monitor that they introduced years ago. And then they also added a 1000 because there's the BVM and then the 2000 because it's sort of a, a stop between that and the 4000 master. It's worth noting, Stacy, that the trim pass is essentially an additional layer of adjustments, um, essentially gain and bias type adjustments layered on top of the standard Dolby tone mapping. So basically, if you're doing a trim pass at 100 nits or a trim pass at 600 nits, it starts by applying its standard you know, tone mapping. And then the colorist gets to essentially lay in metadata into the stream that says, oh, for this one shot, let's pull this back or let's pull back just the reds here or let's do various things that then the display will be able to do some specific tweaking to make a specific shot, scene, whatever, look better than it would just with the standard algorithm. So it's essentially just the extra notes that the display can use to make a shot come out better. And that's one of the key things of Dolby Vision that, that other formats just don't have. Right. Rival, so um, formats, the, I think it was the Philips system, they, their term for it was artistic guidance. <laughs> and that Philips system is SLHDR2, which is mm. one of our montages. Um, so Dolby actually invented the HDR standard we're using today. They created the ST2084 curve, and they pretty much gave that away for free to Simti. But they said, you know what, for the playback, we want to actually charge for that. And so companies had been paying Dolby royalties for years and decided, you know, we really don't want to do that. So they decided to come up with their own tone mapping. And so that's here. Hence we have HDR 10 and it's called 10 because it's 10 bit. Cause you could also have an HDR 12 and then Samsung and others came up with H with Panasonic and others came up with HDR 10 plus as a competitor to it. Because one thing that's not defined is tone mapping. There is no standard that says tone mapping must be done like this. And so Dolby created their tone mapping and their tone mapping algorithm is standard across all Dolby displays. The version that we're using on Blu-ray is 2.9, and that was released around 2014. And then in 2019, Dolby released 4.0. Uh, the first display to support it was the LG C9. But as Don said, you basically get six controls. They're sort of a, small, a subset of colorist controls, lift, gamma gain, chroma weight. And so you'll watch a 600-nit display, and you're like, you know what? I wish the tone mapping did this instead, so let me do a little tweaks to it. And you can make those adjustments on every edit point, so every shot. So, Stacy, real quick before I disappear in a few minutes, we talked about how Dolby Vision has improved with the latest version 4.0 that was released in 2019. But, and this is so critical, I keep on forgetting, this, these improvements are not available for disc Blu-ray uh, content exclusively to streaming. And if people are to stream the latest Dolby Vision version, what are they to expect as far as the actual improvements? So first, you'll never know if you're getting 4.0 or 2.9. And in fact, the only display, so the 2.9 is on the content creation side. There is no 2.9 display other than a first generation uh, Vizio. Instead, the displays are actually using 3.1. So there's okay. no, and they slightly tweak the, the tone mapping. But so, uh, and I would say to this day, Dolby's tone mapping algorithm from 2014 is still better than almost everyone else's by default, just their auto tone mapping algorithm. But with 4.0, they improved the tone mapping algorithm. So it's actually better. They've uh, added additional trim pass controls. So for colors, you get secondaries, which gives them more control. You can actually isolate colors, as Don had mentioned earlier. So it just adds additional capability. And so I told you we have these fixed points, 100, 600. Well, if your display happens to be, say, 800 nits, it actually interpolates between a 1,000 and, and, or sorry, a 600 and 1,000 trim if you've created them. And I also got to point out all the trims are optional. You don't have to do any of them. And some have chosen to go that way. And with 4.0, they also added a custom uh, trim pass. So you could create 327 nits if you wanted to as a trim pass, but only one additional one. So, I, And I think it's worth noting that in practice, like in practice, the, the, a lot of the content is going to look fairly similar because that's sort of by design. They want it to not have drastic differences between Dolby Vision 4.0 and 2.9. So as with any kind of new technology, they're going to adopt these new features kind of slowly and carefully. So as far as what you should expect to see, 
uh, it's going to be subtle, you know, like the, the difference between a 2.9 encoding and a 4.0 encoding of the same film. I mean, a lot of films are not going to go back and re-encode them. If they've already encoded them at 2.9, it's not necessarily worth it to go back and re-encode with 4.0. And 4.0 has a backwards compatibility layer. So if you only have a 2.9 display, it does that. One other key point is the studios did not want 2.9 content to be converted to 4.0 because they knew they created a look with 2.9 and they didn't want to change, you know, without them, you know, consenting basically. However, there's an exception to that. If you have a display that has Dolby IQ, it will actually convert to 4.0 because that only works in 4.0. So for example, if you have an LG, cinema mode is going to be 2.9 on Blu-ray and cinema home will convert to 4.0. On Blu-ray or streaming only? Well, on any of them, oh, okay. any 2.9 source. But it will be, Technically, four point there'll be a four point oh stream, but it will be trying to emulate the two point nine behavior. No, no. In this case, it's let's say for Blu Ray, which is two point nine only, it's going to take that two point nine and convert it into four point oh. So it will actually change the look a little bit. Hmm. But that was mo I only should... to take advantage of Dolby IQ. Hmm. Can I point out also one thing I often see that overlooked in conversations about all this stuff online, uh, and it won't be obviously apparent to end users is. A big benefit of Dolby Vision is uh, this single deliverable. So a lot of the time the studios will supply, instead of supplying a separate HD SDR version and a UHD um, HDR version, they'll just supply the the best version, which is you know the 4,000 nit, the 1,000 nit HDR version. Um, and then we'll create, or we, or the streaming service, or wh whoever's handling the content, um, will create the SDR deliverable from the Dolby Vision Master. So ironically enough, a lot of the time, if you're watching uh, a movie, even on, let's just for uh, argument's sake, say DVD, um, it might have gone through a Dolby Vision process. Well, and uh, also streaming services a long time ago decided it was too much work to create 601 content for, for SD resolution. So it's most of it's 709. And now, someone asked a great question before I leave. This is really good. Is if you have a TV that's an earlier version, two point something, three point something, can a firmware update get your TV or player to? Okay, so it's fixed. well. In most cases, no. <laughs> Technically, pro possibly, but it depends if it's, no. an, if it's an ASIC. Then most likely not. Okay. Now, there's also the issue, and I think you want to talk about was Dolby Vision can look darker than HDR10. Yes, that, there's so, that's the complaint. Now, is it the TV? Is it the actual content? Well, there's a few things. One is the, um, on an LG, for example, when you calibrate, you have a TMAX setting that's in the config file. And so the, on my C9 display, by default, the config file says it's set to 700 nits on all C9s. But my particular C9 is capable of 830 nits. So it's actually not going as bright as it can. So once you do a calibration with CalMan, you can actually upload 830 to the display. That's number one. Number two, 2.9 utilize the mastering display nit level to actually make adjustments as well as whereas 4.0, they took that out because it was causing it to darken the image. And I think the third is the way Dolby tone maps uh, the data above what your display's capability is, they tone map it in such a way where they don't crush detail. So if you use our tone mapping wrap pattern, you'll actually see more detail up to 10,000 versus the HDR10 algorithm, whereas they'll actually crush it, which I think, so they're pulling it down in a different way to preserve the delineations. It's worth pointing out that your perception of the overall brightness of the image mostly has to do with the mid or the high mid tones, right? And if, if a tone mapping algorithm, you know, boosts the high mids, um, the, the overall effect is going to look brighter. If you just boost uh, the the brightest stuff, you're just going to be mostly boosting, you know, like spectral reflections and things like that. It's not going to look that different. It's really, it's kind of like, um, you know, if you want to brighten an image overall, you adjust the gamma curve and you kind of boost the mid and that makes a difference. And so it's just, it's a tone mapping decision. You know, I think that in general, you would expect that the, that more often than not, the Dolby Vision version is going to be closer to what the mastering engineers wanted to see. And the HDR10 is like sort of their best stab at, you know, doing a tone map. And they're deliberately trying to preserve more brightness or they're trying to make the overall picture brighter. So you could, you know, I mean without actually having the director or the mastering engineer in the same room to go, that's too bright or, you know, this looks better, this looks worse, whatever, uh, you're kind of, you know, you're kind of guessing as to which one is right. You know, if one looks brighter than the other, you know, which one is closer to right? Um, as Stacy yeah, says, sometimes they're, 
you know, it gives them the opportunity to take advantage of some extra brightness of the device. The Dolby Vision is being more conservative about saying, well, I know this device can handle this much. We're not going to use any more brightness than that. Was HDR10 can go all the way up to the limits. In other cases, it may be that it's just, you know, it's effectively boosting the midtones, and that's not what was intended. Yeah, so, so there's two. <laughs> let me Sorry. give a couple quick notes real quick. Shrug so, emoji, you know. So there's only two grades of the montage on the disc. There's the HDR10,000 grade, and there's the SDR grade. So the 2000, 1600, they were all actually created using Dolby Vision tone mapping, but that was done offline using the professional tools. And the professional tools are actually done in higher precision. They're usually done in floating point, whereas on the TV side, it's done in integer or whatever. You know, it's cheaper to do in an ASIC. And so, uh, two things about streaming content. So I'm going to say Netflix in particular. I don't know if you've seen the show Sweet Tooth, but I bring this one up because if you have a Sony TV and they have Dolby Vision Bright and Dolby Dark, typically Bright, you know, raises the EOTF and it's brighter. But if you watch Sweet Tooth on a Sony, it's reversed. In Dolby Vision, the Dolby Vision Dark is brighter than Bright, and I'm confused as to what causes that. And the other part of it is there's different content on Netflix that if you watch it in Dolby and then watch it in HDR10, even the color is different. And they mm. could they could literally be two different source files, or yeah. it could just be the two different tone mapping algorithms. Now, on the previous HDR disc, our SDR was actually derived from Dolby Vision, as David mentioned earlier. On this new disc, it was actually hand graded, and in fact, on the LA Skyline shot, we chose different colors, so we could actually tell if it's been. If you're looking at the uh, HDR tone map down, or if you're looking at the SDR grade. Something that's worth noting about streaming services is that effectively on the back end for any particular show, they've got this massive stack. They've basically got a directory somewhere, a folder somewhere on a server that's got all of the different versions of that same show, you know, different resolutions, bit rates, and then different encoding standards because different devices need slightly different variations of MPEG or whatever, you know, they, they encode a different version because that's just easier, you know, and different encoders can do different things. Different settings can do different things. So it is entirely possible, uh, as Stacy mentioned, I think before we went live, uh, that they have two different versions that are were encoded with two slightly different encoders or two different sets of settings for the encoder in order to, you know, this one's for the Roku and this one's for the Apple TV. And they can look just not most of the time, they'll look pretty similar, but every once in a while, you know, something just gets weirdly uh, changed. You know, something is just outside of gamut and it gets clipped by some automatic clipping algorithm and the clipping algorithm is just different something weird like that and so well, yeah like, you can sorry I was, go I was gonna say take like an xbox 360 a lot of content played on it's in vc1 because it didn't really have h2 it certainly doesn't support hevc and it may or may not support h264 so and going back to the roku you could get completely different codecs or you might get the same codec but different profiles it's just the capability of the device so for a streaming service it's a lot of data to yeah. store there's a lot Speaking of them and you'd like to think they'd have some really super sophisticated like <laughs> I think work, you know, working for at Microsoft, it really revealed to me that a lot of high tech companies where you imagine that everybody's sort of sitting around in lab coats, you know, like <laughs> carefully designing these systems to be like super perfect. It's actually a bunch of guys sitting around in a cubicle farm going, I don't know, just stick it up there. It's fine. Do it. You know, speaking it's fine. of um, encoders futzing around with video, this has gone back a while now, like the early Blu-ray days, but we were trying out a whole bunch of encoders and there was one I seem to remember that would distort all the colors and it was uh, um, Rec 709, Rec 601 Matrix Mismatch. Um, which is really more obvious with like, you know, highly saturated greens and stuff like that, but it, it changed the color. Um, and it turned out that the, and we, we went to the vendor and said, well, what, what is, what is, we ended up not using it, but we went to the vendor and like, why is it doing that? And we're like, oh, it shouldn't be doing anything. It should be encoding what you put in. And it turns out that it was, um, everything you were feeding it was internally being converted to RGB. And it, so even if you fed it like a ProRes master, which is YCBCR usually, um, you would go YCBCR into the encoder, it would convert it to RGB, then go back to YCBCR for the, the inevitable output, instead of just passing the values through, you know, more or less unchanged. 
Um, and it turned out that the SDK they were using um, was it, it was able to do that in, because they also wanted to uh, implement it into consumer products where you could uh, change the brightness, change the hue, change the saturation. So um, we weren't getting untouched pixels at the other end of it, basically. Now, but speaking of the encoder decoder, and before I head off, I want to leave you guys with one last question. I'll listen to you guys off air. Is so the three of you are so involved in the actual content creation, knowing the availability of Dolby Vision, the latest 4.0, the decoder encoder, and knowing that it's unique to the streaming platform, is your choice for highest quality content, assuming the creator used everything available to them, is it now on streaming versus disc? Well, disc, you can do 100 megabits per second HEVC, a streaming service that if you're lucky, these, well, at one point, I think they were using 15 megabits per second for UHD, but I know like Amazon and others have tried to push that below 10 megabits per second. So you can absolutely get better compression on disc. Okay, for sure. And it's worth but, noting that, oh, sorry. No I was going to say uh, Dolby Vision uh, Profile 5 uses ICTCP instead of YCBCR, and that's actually a major improvement, and that's only available through streaming services if it's Profile 5. But I'm oh, obviously not Most of these sourcing. mastering houses are QCing on LG monitors, isn't that right? Usually a colorist has a client monitor that, or, yeah, that's an LG. Yeah. I mean, so, honestly, I think right now in practice, probably your best bet is uh, some kind of OLED monitor, LG or Sony, with blu-ray is going to be the closest to what they saw in the mastering studio you know like if that's your if that's your benchmark is to make it look like what the director saw then that is probably the best content um theoretically streaming could do better when everything is just running perfectly but i don't know anybody who has ever watched a streaming channel who has never had it hiccup lag you know go to a lower resolution suddenly get all blocky you know turn into well, pixel vision i would say that the streaming we get today for example on netflix is light years ahead of what we got for broadcast hd i mean right. it just looks so much 100%. better it's progressive the compression's better i mean it's an amazing experience I was just going to say, stream. I'm uh, obviously not an unbiased source since I work with the optical formats, but I, the, 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 my summary would be the using a new version of Dolby Vision on streaming does not outdo the massive uh, compression benefits of, of 4K Blu-ray. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing to point out is we were talking a little bit about how the uh, streaming services work behind the scenes and how they'll have you know, various different versions of a, a title uh, usually automatically encoded, um, possibly with some manual intervention. Keep in mind that when you get buy a 4K Blu-ray disc for a BD, um, there's one version on there, and that's the one we put this, the, the time into getting right. That's not to say every single 4K or, or a BD title is going to be magnificently and, you know, fine-tuned and encoded, but the possibility is there in a way that's less likely to happen on the stream. No. Service. There have been some Blu-rays, I won't say who they are, where they actually put multiple lossless audio tracks and had very little bitrate for the video. Or sometimes they'll try to put two versions of the same movie on a disc so you'll get two low bitrate movies. So just because it's disc doesn't mean you'll get the best compression either. Yeah, and, and, it, um, and it's worth noting that the disc compression process still most of the time does involve an actual compressionist going through and looking for problems and figuring them out, whereas streaming services typically do not do this. You now, know, they've got so many different versions, they just can't. You know? But sadly, I don't think there's any HEVC encoder that has segment re-encoding. Basically, you break the movie into chunks yourself and do encode it separately, which we had to do on our disc. We had to break into three we're, segments. Uh, we're, we're looking into that. Um, yeah. At the moment, it's kind of a case of uh, scan through the title at the beginning, and if there's a scene with flash lights or rain or something then we'll isolate that into its own little mini like segment so if it falls apart we can quickly uh quickly well, remedy it i know people have complained about the banding in the martian the hd hd really or hdr release but they actually broke that movie into segments and applied different strings of dither because the banding was in the source so that's another on, thing uh, when um when when there's a some kind of issue in the title it's very logical, and I'm guilty of this myself in the past as well. It's very logical to assume that it happened uh, on the way to disk, but a lot of the time there are problems in the source as well. Masters are not um, as perfect, perfect as people would like to believe. And when it comes to streaming, um, so not too long ago, I got all the best streaming devices to test them out. And you know, the Roku Ultra on paper kind of supports everything you would want it to, kind of similar to like an Apple TV. But the problem is 
certain apps like Amazon Prime, when you watch HDR, it drops it to 8 bit. So then you get massive clusterization. If even watching Amazon Prime on the Apple TV, it's 10 bit, it looks a lot better, but it doesn't look as good as on their own Fire devices. So mm. certain apps have well, different versions for different players that so can affect the quality as well. Over the last year or so, there was a big push at Amazon to actually redo their catalog in AV1. And their compression expert there, he wasn't a big fan of that scenario. So they sort of just ignored him. And so, because again, they're trying to push 4K down to about six or seven megabits per second. I, th I thought I saw that uh, last year or some maybe the year before Netflix was trying to up it to like 30 or something. Um, don't know if they did. But well, Netflix know, like Sony has the Bravia core, which is supposed to be like 80. Netflix puts a lot of time and effort into building better encoding pipelines. I mean, they really, I think they're leading the way on that. But then the quality of Apple, TV, Apple original shows, I mean, like Ted Lasso just looks beautiful. And I imagine, I mean, that's going to be a source issue as well, because if you have, um, since I deal mainly with back catalog content, a big part of my job is compressing foam grain. Um, <laughs> but if you have something that's, because uh, like if, if, if the, that's the biggest test, because if the foam grain isn't compressed well, you just end up with this kind of mushy Bushy, uh, yeah. wallpaper mm. paste. Like I've seen, I've seen like, uh, I, I won't say which one, but like a movie I was watching in a streaming service, it was a beautiful new 4K scan under the hood. I, I could tell I could tell it looked good once, but it, it was it was just like buzzing, swirling, corrupted patterns. Um, whereas something like like you said, Ted Lasso or something, you I imagine all these new shows are going to be shot on um, high digital, digital video, cameras, yeah, which is the level of quantization needed to get a down to a little bit rate is going to be a lot less. Well, like we've um, talked, so yeah. We've talked because, uh, you know, I get frustrated when my QP is greater than like eight or something. And here you are dealing with granny movies where your QP is in, in the 30s. So um, usually on 4K BD, it's about um, if, if we can, you know, max out and encode at like 95, 96 megabits per second. We'll usually not go to the full 99 because if you do that, yeah. you're going to end up with a spike in the audio, which is going to stop the whole process. And you're, then you're going to be weak spine. Um, 95 megabits per second. It's usually QPs are about 21. Okay. Um, well, an X265 is not the best at hitting the target bit rate. Um, like when we worked on VC1, we made sure that if you said 99 megabits per second, it's not going to go above it. X265, there's a little slop in there and it can overshoot a little bit and underflow and not mux as we found out. The, the encoders designed specifically for disk are, I think, a lot more stricter about that. Yeah. Like uh, a lot stricter, like the CinemaCraft encoders, like what became uh, Series Pixels. Uh, that are used on a lot of titles in Hollywood. They, if you, yeah, they, they will hit the target more or less exactly. Um, but like a, a more general purpose encoder, uh, where disk wasn't the primary design goal, it'll yeah, it'll be a little more open right, chance. So, uh, thank you for coming by, FOMO. Uh, so we'll just one final comment from everybody about the Dolby Vision thing because I know the the number one question everyone always asks: do, Should they ignore Samsung because they don't have Dolby Vision or? you know, another TV, or if this TV doesn't have good Dolby Vision, should they still consider it? So can you guys mention what you think is a buying reason to can to want Dolby Vision, or does it not matter that much to you? Especially, like, the S95C, it's about 1,400 nits peak, you know, almost 300 nits full field. It's pretty capable as far as an HDR display goes. So Blu-ray specifically, Dolby Vision on Blu-ray, there's a number of bugs that are in the SDK that have been there for a long time. And because of that, I actually bought a Mad VR Envy and I don't use Dolby Vision on Blu-ray. Okay. So for me, I could use any display. And mm -hmm. Samsung is currently making a big push to get QD OLEDs into uh, as a client monitor as well. They're trying to yeah. get, you know, LG out. Yeah, yeah, slightly off topic. Um, yeah, I hope that happens soon. And one of the issues that I saw even with the G3 is while uniformity is better, measurably the uniformity is nowhere near as good as QD OLED. I mean, you can go anywhere on the screen and it's a delta error of less than one difference. So that could theoretically be fixed. So LG had introduced a professional OLED that had uh, uniformity adjustments. Mm -hmm. And that's actually in the chipset. It's just not exposed on the consumer displays. Yeah. So if there could be pressure to get LG to actually open that up, then you could actually mm -hmm. greatly improve uniformity calibration in the field. But you would need some type of like 2D colorimeter. I imagine the factory, they're like taking a picture of a gray field or something and automatically writing values. Yeah, it's a 2D right? color emitter, so it can do right. it. Look at the whole screen at once and do zones, but they've only got a certain amount of time on the on the line. Uh, and I'm sure I'm sure it doesn't age linearly either. <laughs> That's wishful thinking. That's a good point. I think from my perspective, the the thing is that most uh, movies that are 
that are being mastered now, they're pretty conservative about the grade. They want it to look pretty yes. good on a wide variety of monitors. So does it matter a lot? Like in theory, it could matter a lot. Yeah. It could, you know, the Dolby Vision could be more capable. It could handle a wider range of monitors with a lot more uh, contrast, HDR contrast. But in practice, I think everybody is aware that there's just going to be going out on a lot of different monitors. And so they'll, you know, they'll sort of pull it in and make sure that the core image is well within the specs of most available monitors. So the net result is that, you know, it, it, Dolby Vision is a great standard. I, from a technical standpoint, I love it. I think it's a really well thought out standard and better than HDR 10 plus um, in lots of ways. But what you, the consumer, are going to see as far as the differences, most of the time, it's going to be pretty subtle. And I think most of the time you're going to get it, you're going to have the capacity to get a, a quite good image on a display that doesn't have uh, Dolby Vision. You know, that could change over time. If if, more, if Dolby Vision gets more, it's, it's that kind of chicken and egg thing. If Dolby Vision becomes ubiquitous, then they will start using the features of Dolby Vision a lot more and they'll get a little more radical, a little less conservative with the grading and suddenly you're gonna get some some content that really only looks <laughs> great on a Dolby Vision monitor and it's gonna look okay, okay on something that doesn't have Dolby Vision. But right now, that's not really the case for most things. Certainly big budget Hollywood films and so forth, they're, they're kind of playing things safe, I would say. And I mean, so I, Stacy yeah. would know more about that. Don's point about them and being conservative. Yeah, Don's point about them being conservative is spot on, right? They are not being aggressive. Whereas, you know, we had three goals with the montage. I wanted to shoot, finish in 8K. I wanted to go all the way up to 10,000 nits, and I wanted to go all the way out to 2020. Basically, I wanted to push this. I wanted to utilize the full spec. So our content is certainly going to be a lot more aggressive, more difficult, you know, challenging, versus your average feature film or television show. To the question, would I consider a display without Dolby Vision? Uh, I personally wouldn't, but I'm then again, I'm, I'm mastering this stuff, so I don't want to buy a display that I can't check out one of the yeah. Dolby Vision titles I've done on. Uh, if I'm trying to think, if I was like an average consumer, I mean, it, it, it it's so hard to say because the the quality of displays with being put out by the smaller number of factor, smaller number of manufacturers in the TV game is really good. So if it was a question of would you would you choose a, a lesser quality display panel um I, I wouldn't choose a lesser quality display panel just to get dolby vision but consumers don't have to make that choice like there are dolby vision enabled really good displays out there so it's um it it it, it would be an agonizing choice but it kind of isn't because <laughs> of market <laughs> market realities basically now I really like QD OLED, but there is one thing, at least I haven't seen the current generation, but the previous, the first time I saw it, credits happened to be rolling and I saw the red outline on white text. And so mm -hmm. as a computer monitor or for gaming, mm -hmm. I might have a difficult time with it. But feature films, television shows, that's a lot more difficult to see. Yeah, most people, they don't see the fringing. It's not just the red, it's uh, red and green, depending if it's above or below. Sure. Um, so with the 77s, obviously the pixels are larger, from my seating distance about nine feet away if there's a bright scene with black bars i see it on the black bars if there's you know large text on the screen i can see it from that distance most people don't see it um, but it's also one of those things that once you do you're kind of <laughs> subconsciously <laughs> always seeing it for, for me book. personally that's that is nothing compared to that um sub pixel layout those old sharp displays used like the sharp do you remember the sharp uh it was like 10 years ago now the it was the us oh, the, is that the with the yellow display? pixel yeah or? with the yellow no no okay, no not yellow it. specifically just with everything like it, it's the way they would generate intermediate uh brightness shades and i think it was done to improve the viewing angle it, if you had if you put a full white screen on the thing it would look like a normal rgb stripe sub pixel layout but if you were at like 50, if you had it to show 50% gray, um, I, I, it's too long ago now. I forget exactly uh, what they did, but it looked, it, the, the end effect was that what what in the video signal was a straight line would come as a little subtle zigzag effect. So Samsung LCDs, uh, in oh, order yeah. to improve off axis, they have a similar issue like that, right? Although it's, it's at the point we're at now with UHD resolution, um, it's, you know, it's getting harder and harder to see. But yeah, like if you're using it as a computer monitor, and your nose is pressed right up against it, it all, mm. that kind of stuff starts to matter. But unless you've actually seen what the source looks like, 
you don't really know what you're missing anyways. So it's harder to judge unless you see something that that's, you know, well, that stands out. With photorealistic content, yeah, but if you're looking at the Windows Start menu and you know, oh no, I was talking about yeah, movies, <laughs> movies and television. Yeah, yeah. For movies, yeah, it'd be hard well, to I was see. thinking of the comment that's on screen now about preferring non Dolby Vision. Okay, yeah, uh, thank you, Joey, for the super chat. Uh, with the WRGB Sony's, um, I even feel they do not do Dolby Vision well just on the TV side, um, and generally, I do recommend uh, it's e actually easy on them to disable Dolby Vision because. With those Sony's, you have to go into the menu and change the HDMI setting to even allow it in the first place. Um, so if you just set it to 4K enhanced, everything comes through as HDR10 and it's consistent. Uh, but like I mentioned earlier, with those TVs, when you're watching certain Dolby Vision content, sometimes dark is brighter than bright. Sometimes bright start, you, there's no consistency with them. And, and isn't Dolby isn't dark mode supposed to be the normal Dolby Vision mode on Sony? Dark is supposed to be like out of the box. It's the more accurate EOTF one, but like even after like calibration there's times you're watching content and sometimes it's brighter on dark than it is on bright uh, they're just very weird and, right, but, and dark is just always, such a, yeah. it's such a bad name as a preset yeah <laughs> uh, it sounds like to me sony has just generated two different um tone mapping algorithms and well, instead this would be, of this would be instead a of the site i'm sorry it'd be a feature it, since it's dolby vision it would actually be a feature of dolby vision because Dolby's not going to let you make certain changes on top of their content. So Dolby has like Dolby IQ and they've got, which will actually raise midtones. And... Uh, so Sony has a real, you know, Dolby's also very thing. Dolby's very strict when you're in Dolby Vision mode. Mm -hmm. They can do anything they want in non Dolby Vision mode. Yeah. Dolby Vision uh, mode, they have requirements. Well, and then Dolby Sony Vision doesn't also... have a dark and light mode it inherently does... in the spec. So Sony did something. You well, know the I'm dark saying? mode. Like, who has the power in that relationship? Right. The Sony dark, or dark, Dolby? Dark is the normal mode. They just called it dark. Yeah, there's also the Dolby Vivid mode and stuff too. But yeah, so Dolby the, has the added other... other modes to, to, to address like content in a, in a bright room so they've actually added new capability yep. and then the other issue with sony is or, is they still use judd mostly and then dolby requires d65 so they have an offset and then when you calibrate the tv to d65 then that offset screws with it if you use the same color temperature so it it's a lot of inconsistencies for the general user um so generally i tell people to disable it on those ones the a95k though their QD OLED, uh, I think that one's great with Dolby Vision. There was a lot of change with that. Uh, but Buddy Love, thank you for the super chat. Uh, thoughts on ATSC 3.0 from a grading standpoint? Uh, should have something better for today's display tech? Well, the grading would be independent of the delivery. Yeah. But since I stream everything, I have no experience with ATSC anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I haven't yet to try it, or I don't have an antenna to even do that. <laughs> <laughs> so. Okay, so uh, we'll start heading into um, the disc now. I, I have the second one in uh, currently. So this is the one with the demo and the skin tones. Um, so I just did a, the group one real quick. And actually, I can make that screen bigger. There we go. It's so surreal seeing this playing on a display other than the one in my office. The thing is actually <laughs> out now. I can't quite believe it. <laughs> Can you go to one of the individual models? Yep. And you don't need to return to the menu. You can just use the left and right arrows. Okay. And it'll be much going fun. back to the, the start of it and skip through each one. Well, if you would have pressed the right arrow, it would have gone straight to this clip. Oh, That's okay. the last clip. Wraps so around. one thing I want to point out here is the lower left um, chip on the color checker chart. That should measure around somewhere between 132 and 134 nits, depending on where you point the colorimeter at. Um, and in static tone mapping and in Dolby Vision, that's exactly what it measures. But on LGs and Samsungs, as soon as you enable dynamic tone mapping, that tends to measure over 200 nits. So they're definitely bumping up areas that alter the artistic intent. Yeah, so I can actually demonstrate that. I mean, I can't, uh, not measurably, but you should visibly see this okay. change. So now that this has static and active, I mean, I'm sure you just saw the whole shift the background get brighter from yeah. the background, yeah. So wait, with when you're feeding in HDR10 plus content on this display and you tell it to static, it well it, HDR10 plus shouldn't have static and active, right? Right. That's what I'm. What does that? Um, do? That's yeah. interesting. I don't know what that does. Yeah. Why is why is that an option? <laughs> yeah. So the active setting does boost the EOTF quite a lot. 
So the active yeah, so it's boosts HDR10 plus. Yeah. Interesting. So a couple more points about the the skin tone content, or a few things. Once that goes away. So the majority of the everything in the screen, uh, with the exception of maybe a reflection of the earrings, the nose ring, or the bolt holding the color checker chart, is below 200 nits. But those particular elements, the earrings and the and the bolt, are around 800 nits. And then the background wall is actually a gradient. So it was a light at the bottom shooting upwards to produce a gradient. So if it's a good test for banding. And then there's two different light sources. Uh, directly on her face, sort of the, the primary light or the key light is uh, D65. But on the lower right-hand corner shining up, which reflects off the top of the chart or the bolt on the chart, as well as the side of her face, is actually a 3200 Kelvin light source. So more tungsten colored. This way you get two different uh, light sources and you can see how it impacts her skin tones. Um, makeup is only done on their face, so their necks, their shoulders, all of that is actually has no makeup. So on certain models, you can sort of see it with and without makeup. You know, when we were discussing doing skin tone content, you know, we're like, should we use makeup? Should we not use makeup? And it's really hard to get a consensus. So by having it on their face and not on the rest of them, it actually worked out really well. And what I actually did is um, for me to do videos I'm, I'm starting to do my videos in hdr now and doing color correction for my videos and what i wanted to do was make sure that the camera matched like what i'm producing matches as close as possible to what i see in person so i used the uh, group one with the color checker to record in log and then put it on the the mac and then started grading using that footage and then looking back at the screen until it matched as closely as i could I know one of the problems I've seen, and you and I have talked about before, is when people have two displays, you know, the camera might white balance to one of the displays. Mm -hmm. uh, in that case, it might be good to have two cameras and then oh, bring yeah. them together and That's... split so they're each white balanced to the display itself. That's my uh, I think I end up making this year. point every time I'm on a podcast like this. Every year, Value Electronics does the shootout. Mm -hmm. um, and there's obviously someone like uh, watching on YouTube. Without fail, people will start saying that one looks blue, that one looks red. <laughs> Uh, and it doesn't matter how many times you say you, you need to be in the room to see this. It, it, it's I, it's people just they pick up on what they see with their eyes, right? And it's impossible to judge the quality streaming because one, you got the camera doing its own color thing. Then on the on the playback side, depending on your browser on OS, it may or may not be color managed. Yeah. So there's lots of differences. So here in the Brady and, and Bunch. The <laughs> I was going to say here we have four different uh, Caucasians, but they all have very different skin tones. And so there is no matter how, like there's an unlimited supply of skin tones. You can never cover them all. And even getting this, it was difficult to get the models that we had because we shot this February 29th of 2020. Had we waited one more week, we wouldn't have any of this footage because of the COVID lockdowns. So we were lucky to get this when we did. Yeah, as far as the, the upcoming TV shootout, uh, I know FOMO has two of the same cameras as me, uh, the Sony a7 IV. So hopefully we'll have enough of the same cameras that we can at least per technology you know one camera for the qd oleds one for the you know, to at least the, help the amount of the, the amount of light that these displays are putting out anyway it's going to be surely it's going to be clipped well you still need to expose yeah. for each display individually as well right it's you it's challenging camera per dis you'd need one camera per display and uh exactly like accurate and turn off all the auto iris and auto everything now I told the story before, but the, the motion section and the skin tones on my hard drive, that content here, plus all the stuff on disk one fit in 100 gigabytes. But as soon as you put it onto Blu-ray, because the, the, the minimum size, uh, our smallest patterns actually take up more space than they did on a hard drive. The sector size is larger sector size, on Blu-ray. Yeah. 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 So our small patterns became bigger just because they had to hit that. And so with the configuration, um, you know, for someone who buys the disc, you can pick the format of the the the, the patterns and uh, but not the demonstration material, like the actual video demo at the end. You pick directly, but um, so this is on HDR10 Plus right now. So one I... caveat: so the peak luminance here only applies to the patterns in the motion section. The skin tone content, it's all 1,000 nits. Dolby Vision 10 Plus and 10, it's all 1,000 is what it's mastered to. Yeah, so if I clicked on 10, then I can change the luminance here. Yeah, and again, that's only going to affect the patterns in the motion section, which are just two patterns. 
Um, and let's see. On this particular disc, on the other disc, it affects yeah, other yeah. patterns. Yeah. And so the knit level will obviously impact the colors here. This one, it's just metadata. Actually, on right. both of these, I think it might actually just be metadata. Yeah, some of the some of the different luminance levels for the patterns actually have different pixel data in them, right? Like the yeah. the, the peak white ones. Sometimes it's just the right. So, the, for example, the, the all the window patterns they don't change. Only the metadata changes between the different uh, knit level versions. But then other patterns, like the color space eval pattern and the dynamic range high pattern, those will actually change based on knit level. Now, there's actually boxes on here that you can't see. So this pattern we originally designed to try to show the the sort of flicker that comes out of black on an OLED. It never really worked for that, but then others found a different use for this, showing some of the sort of smearing that's occurring on QD OLED that doesn't occur on WRGB OLED. And that seemed to have been fixed at least with this generation or okay. this model of this generation. Or at least mostly mitigated. And when you see motion HFR, HFR is, our, is just what we're calling uh, 5994. We should point out also the disk you have at the moment. Did we end up calling it disk two or disk three? But this it's, is disk um, two. There's a lot more test patterns on here on this one and three. This is like the least uh, um, populated of the disks in terms of the number of different patterns on it. Yeah, so the uh, two of my favorite montages on this disk are the HDR analyzer and the graded versus ungraded. Mm -hmm. So graded versus ungraded shows you what Shane, the colorist, saw when he first loaded the footage in Resolve. And then you see how much work he had to actually do to get the final results. Like several yeah. shots, he had to push at least one or two stops brighter. Yeah, so this I really liked. And I wanted to show this specifically on this TV because since all of Samsung HD RTVs, the auto gamut selection doesn't work. Um, so the TV is always in P3. So the QD OLED has 90% BT2020 coverage. However, unless you manually go change it to BT2020, it's at 75%, the same as a WRGB. Um, and a lot of people ask, well, should you do that? But the problem is when you do make that change, then everything's oversaturated to a point that you can't fix it. So all HDR content is delivered in 2020. Even if they grade mm -hmm. in P3, it's put inside a 2020 container. So it is in fact 2020. It just may not use the full color volume. But I'd like yeah. to actually talk about some of this, this particular analyzer because some people might have questions. Yeah, yeah, I was going to do that. Um, but I do want to just show real quick this issue um because this having this is very helpful in demonstrating why it's fine to be in its p3 so when it's on auto you see it's dci p3 and if you have to go to custom and change this to get the full 90 percent but then everything's going to be oversaturated and so auto is what's supposed to happen is auto is supposed to read the mastering display info that's in the stream and respond to that well it the problem is the BT2020 one should not be completely oversaturated. They're calibrating okay. the P3 one, but not this one. So you get okay. this and everything's way oversaturated. You go to P3 and then it's a lot more accurate, but then you're restricted to the 75% of the gamut. Sounds very complicated and sounds like everyone will get it wrong. <laughs> I mean, that that could be a description of the entire um, consumer display industry, couldn't yeah. it? <laughs> but again, like I said, nothing is delivered to the consumer in DCI P3. Everything yeah. is delivered in 2020. So, yep. uh, yeah, I remember that's... somebody saying that Hollywood in general is like the most professional group of amateurs you'll ever see in your <laughs> life. And I totally get what they're saying. It's like, people are really operating at the absolute the top of their game you know these people are really knowledgeable about their field and so forth there's but there's a lot of stuff that's very slapdash in the actual practice you know people will just be like you know you've got this really high t all this technology and stuff and people will be like moving files around you know on like a usb stick and you know just like really these very uh manual processes and stuff and that's Sometimes on set as well, people will do this stuff that's really kind of, you know, they're used to like uh, gaffer tape and bailing wire solutions um, next to, you know, many thousands of dollars of high tech equipment. You know, it's just whatever works, whatever works. And that's kind of the guiding force in, 
in uh, Hollywood in general. It just permeates everything. You know, you do whatever works, you get it done. I don't know, David, I'm sure can speak to that more, but. Oh, I mean, I'm not a non set guy. I just wanted to say, you reminded me of that gag in that, was it season three episode of The Simpsons? And the punchline is, uh, what is it? Something like dogs, it's like some animal. Dogs don't like, don't look like dogs on film. So you have to tape a bunch of cats together. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm butchering the joke. Go watch the episode. <laughs> so if we, if we look at the HDR analyzer, the all the analysis tools. So on the upper left, you have a waveform monitor. Upper right, you have the CIE diagram and two bars, which I'll explain. Lower left is a tone map down image to give you a good, pretty picture to look at. And bottom right is a black and white image that shows you uh, it's a gamma warning. So let's see where to begin. So the upper left... So first, all the tools, so upper left, upper right, and lower right are based on the 10,000 nit master. And then that 10,000 nit is then tone mapped down to 1,000 just for viewing in the lower left corner. So the first bar uh, closest to the waveform monitor, you have two numbers. That number in the middle that says 99.2 nits, that's the average picture level of the frame. And that number at the bottom, which is probably 9,000, I can't tell blurry, uh, is the peak luminance on the pattern. And so you, then you can also look at the waveform monitor and see, I think at the top line that will blink red and on and off is 4,000 nits and the very top of the frame is 10,000. And you can see a line we added for 350 nits. The bar to the right of that is the gamut bar. 100% would be 100% of P3. And then everything above that is going into 2020. And that's reflected both on the CIE diagram to the right, as well as the gamut on the bottom. Uh, the, when you see the orange pixels, that means it's pretty much right around 100%. And when the pixels turn red, that means it's beyond 100%. So it's in the 2020 range, which correlates to the CIE diagram. Now, the CIE diagram is actually made up of little, little pixels. So some pixels you won't actually be able to see just because it's a single pixel in a 4K area. Does that make sense? Did I go too fast? Uh, no, I was going to point out just a little bit for people. That, if it's black and white, basically it's within 709 or the lower end of p3 as it turns orange so like where the uh well like if it's if it's black part? and white it's fully within p3 okay yeah and then when it's orange is that when it's at the edge of p3 or crossing over that's when it's starting to cross over p3 okay. right. we're basically 100 percent p3 so basically like this part over there where it's red that's where it's more into bt 2020 yep and what you'll notice as you start looking at the footage is a lot of the colors that go beyond p3 they're actually very dark they're not bright so if you go to the quantum dot vials, you'll see it's it's way beyond P3 in the green when it's very dark, but once it gets bright, it comes within P3. Yep. And that correlates all over. So the waveform monitor left to right are the actual pixels left to right, but then the height is the level of the pixel, the pixel value or code value. So the brighter the pixel gets, the higher it moves up in that axis. But I really like this because it sort of gives you, it, one, it shows you what the footage is. And two, it sort of, helped, like I said, it, darker colors tend to be uh, in the wider gamut area. And it lets you know on screen if you want to know uh, what's a 2020 pixel look like, what it is. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, real quick, uh, Joey, thank you for the super chat. Uh, for watching movies and older shows, what 77 plus set would you recommend over the A90J? Um, so... Which one is the A90J? Is it a... uh, that was 2021 uh, heat sink WRGB OLED? Okay. So basically, if you're saying 77 and higher, um, then you know there's this the S95C, the G3, and the A95L are the main upgrades. But as far as anything in the 80s, there's not really anything in the 80s that I recommend currently. Right, because like for example, the G3, the 77 inch has MLA, but the 83 mm -hmm. inch does not. Yep. And every 83-inch OLED to date is still using that same panel that was used in the A90J and the C1. They haven't updated the 83s yet. So this is a, a good example here. So the very far right vial, a lot of times on some displays in HDR10, you'll start to get a purple tinge to it. Uh, but in Dolby Vision, it actually maintains the blue. In fact, there's several shots in the montage uh, where you'll get a huge shift in HDR10, but not in Dolby Vision. So and that's probably a good spot where if I do switch it to BT 2020, it'll, you should really be able to see where it oversaturates. And this is where people get confused. They think they see that change by changing the setting and think that it's a benefit, but they're not realizing that it's just because it's becoming 
so oversaturated. I wish it sort of didn't take up the whole UI screen as much as it does. Yeah. Like you can see that, like they just think that that's more how it should be, but it's really like, especially if you're looking at skin tones and you do this, you're going to see the ears turn magenta. Mm. Um, or on the first disc, I'll do it again, where you have the, the full colors <clears throat> from black to white on the screen. Um, and you do, you toggle this, you see just a huge shift. So, but it's not so much that it's the content calling for that extra gamut more so is it just the oversaturation of all the colors but that's specific to samsung that's just something that uh, they've had broken since 2015 <laughs> well and you saw i think it was one of the uh the gamut patterns i showed you where certain displays samsung jvc and others can't handle 100 percent stimulus and 100% saturation window pattern, whereas Sony mm -hmm. and LG and Dolby Vision all handle it correctly. So it seems to be a corner case they missed. Uh, and this is the S95C. So on this shot, if you if you want to go back real quick, just hit chapter back. So every chapter point will jump to each shot. Okay. Oh, we went back too far. I only hit it once. David, is that a bug on your side? Or? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully <Okay>. not. <laughs> so go ahead and pause it. So uh, again, on this one, on the far right side of the screen, the crane you see, and again, I'm talking about the new montage. The old one had gamma clipping issues, which made things purple. But in this one, this is another indicator mm -hmm. where if you see purple, it's a hue shift in that uh, crane. It should be more blue. Yeah. There's so much uh, little uh, high frequency details in there as well. That's a, incidentally a perfect shot for um, seeing if the TV is doing any like, uh, sharpening shenanigans in the picture. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for this, it's not that the content isn't native to it because it's all in BT2020. It's that the grading is done knowing that they should restrict to P3 because that's what most displays can do. Um, What's interesting about this particular scene on the last disc, uh, Dave, I'm sure you remember last year at the shootout, how on this building there's a flag, and mm -hmm. right next to the flag on every Sony except for the reference monitor, there would be a cluster of pixels, an artifact, mm -hmm. because their processing wasn't disabled. So right. even when you disable their processing, I don't think it's disabled, because right. if you put up our e any single pixel yeah. checkerboard pattern, our EOTF well, tracking pattern, it never blends on a Sony. Mm -hmm. There is, mastering a, monitor. there is a way to disable it, and it's to use the graphics picture mode. It will then lock out all of the processing options, so you can't even turn any on. But yeah, that's one thing I've noticed. Like Sony always gets high grades for their motion and their uh, you know, gradations and whatnot, but people don't realize that when it's off, it's still on low, really. Like they're, right. they every just shootout, label it that way. Every shootout, when John I... is like, oh, I love the Sony. It's got so much more detail, and I've turned everything off. No, it doesn't. <laughs> yeah, but if when you put I, it in um, graphics mode, you'll actually see it with it off. Okay, that's good. When I know. reviewed displays at um, AV Forums and HDTV Test in the UK, um, it was Samsung. For some reason, for the European market, um, they for a while insisted on the, the noise reduction off control didn't mean off, it meant low. So if you're watching something shot on 35 millimeter film, we always use Gladiator. And, you know, that just it's just meant to have a light sheen of grain. You would see all the swimming, motion, powdery, temporal processing artifacts. Um, and the only way to, to disable it was to put, similarly, to put the TV into PC mode. But then you would lose, um, it would force into 60 hertz. So all your 24p input content would have 3 to pull down jitter added to it. Is there anything like that in Sony, or can you use the graphics mode without any other... Uh, penalty is it a good solution using well, yeah i guess mode? what are the penalties of most, graphics mode yeah most people won't use graphics mode because let's say you do want a little bit of that smooth gradation or you do want cine motion turned on or motion smoothing or something you can't it's either you get a little bit of everything or nothing of everything but if i feed because i'm I was considering getting a um, qd oled uh, pretty mm -hmm. soon but if they're you know if you can't get a correct picture out of it i'll have to reconsider it can you um in the graphics mode is 24p reproduced as 24p i believe so um okay cool and it doesn't so it doesn't it doesn't like sabotage the tone mapping or anything like that no no, no it's just okay the, cool anything in the clarity menu basically that when it says off isn't really off, it actually does shut it off. Now, does um, graphics mode give you 444 mode as well? 
I have not tried that. Okay. Um, I've only it's probably used it before, right? It's probably intended for use because computers. on the LG with yeah, I this... believe it does, but I'm not entirely sure. Right. So pre three series, so the CX, the C1, or the CX, the C1, C I. So many model numbers. You mm -hmm. used to have to change the icon to PC mode to get true 444 mode. Now with mm -hmm. the C and G3, they actually made it a picture, a menu option. And when you enable it, it also disables a bunch of controls. And the controls mm -hmm. that's disabling are the controls that have to work in 422. Yeah. And 422 versus 444 on a display should not make any difference on content that's 420. But in fact, it does. So clearly, there's multiple conversions between 422 and 444 that's causing loss. I think I can quote Yogi Berra when he said, in theory, there's no difference between theory and practice, but in practice, <laughs> there is. There's some wisdom for you. Um, okay, so got a question about the disc. Uh, the disc three with the SDR, um, does it have uh, grayscale patterns? So other than some subtle differences, it has almost all the same patterns. So for example, the analysis section has uh, zero to a hundred percent and five percent steps except for i think we have some one percent steps below five percent so zero one two three four five ten fifteen twenty twenty five thirty yeah. yeah so we have a lot more the sdr disc is pretty much full in both 709 and 2020 sdr because when sdr when when uhd came out the intention was 2020. however the first displays only supported 709 and thus everyone went 709 for uhd uh Where's the 4,000 nit option? Was that removed? Yeah, it, so the 10,000, you could think of as the 4,000. It was graded on a 4,000 nit display, but we used scopes to push elements to 10,000. Okay. The previous 4,000 used some tone mapping, and it did not do a very good job, so there was a lot of crush detail. Okay, because especially the horses scene, if you went from 4,000 to 10,000, you'd see everything blown out on 4, whereas most of the TVs yeah. could do 10. And that was the tone mapping from the master to 4,000. So that's when we didn't do it this time. It just You can consider the 10 similar to 4. All right, uh, I'm going to go ahead and throw in the first disc now. Um, so just give me a second. Now for the HLG version, unfortunately, one, Blu-ray doesn't allow HLG transfer function. So we tried to use an alternate method, an SCI message, and it works off USB stick. But when muxed on Blu-ray, it seems to be stripped out. So you have to manually put the display into HLG mode to see HLG, which was the same on the last disc as well. Yeah, as far as Blu-ray is considered, they um, uh, recognize BDMV HDR, which is HDR10. Uh, they added 10 plus, obviously Dolby Vision and uh, SL HDR2, which I think uh, this maybe must be the only, only piece of content using it. Yep, and the C9 I think was the last LG display that supported it, and I'm not aware of any players that support it. So we have it on disc. It is there. So in the theory, the player filters. shouldn't be. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you, you want to explain the blue color filters? <laughs> they don't work. Uh, <laughs> although I will say surprisingly, they, they this, will work they kind if you of have it. <laughs> if you have a CRT suspended. TV, they will work okay. They will they work will... fine on a CRT TV, but. Um, so on LG, it kind of works. On my Sony Z9D, with 10 filters stacked, it still doesn't work. So it really depends on the display. But Samsung has a, should have an RGB-only mode, and you'd rather use that than the filter. I don't think but, it does anymore. Yeah. I know they used to, but I don't think it does now. But we found that people get really upset if they don't get the filter, which is only used on one pattern. So we put the filter back in. Now, uh, Don went out and perked. How much money did you spend, Don, buying every filter gel you could find? I spent many hundreds of dollars buying all, every kind of gel I bought. Uh, yeah, I bought about a thousand dollars worth of like really, really high end, um, you know, uh, color filters that are used in, you know, science and like laser physics and stuff like that. Trying to find a blue filter just to, just to see if we could find a blue filter that would work on a modern TV. and. Nothing worked. You know, we, we've got some super, super selective notch filters and they still didn't work because the blue uh, phosphor, or, you know, the phosphors, the blue filters on modern TVs have a very wide spectrum. You really, you know, and the, on the other, it's not the blue filters that are the problem. It's the other ones, the green and, and red. They're so wide that you just can't filter them out entirely 
with a with any kind of real world filter. It just doesn't work. Um, they all have high gamut and they all have CMSs. So, you know, and of course, on top of that, you really shouldn't be adjusting color and tint. Um, if it's wrong, the chances that making adjustments to the, you know, to the user controls are going to fix your problem is basically very small. And in general, in whatever the, the closest mode, like cinema or you know, filmmaker mode or something like that, the color and tint should be spot on. There's no reason for it to be off at all. It's digital video. Color and tint was designed to fix problems with analog video. So it, it's not really a useful um, control anymore, but, you know, it's it's been around so long. It's traditional. They put it in there. People, you know, complain if it's not there. So... And when Simti created the HD color bars and the HDR color bars, they actually removed the section to even set tint. Uh, one of the filters Dom bought, I think it was between, it was a glass filter, it was either 60 or $80, and it performed worse than the plastic filter we have, the gel. Yeah. And then we also, you also tried different notches to stack on top of each other, which would theoretically, it sounds like it should work, and it still did not work. So we spent a lot of time and money trying to find a solution. Yeah, if the if the spectrum of the various um, of the RGB, you know, if the G and B overlap B uh, substantially, which they do in practice, there isn't any way to to make a filter work. Like a filter is just not going to work. There's too much overlap, and you're going to get leakage between the various channels, and that's just the nature of color. You know, like. The, the spectrums do not need to be disjoint. In fact, they never are fully disjoint. It's just that on CRTs, they were disjoint enough that a filter more often than not would work on most TVs, especially a good filter. Our filter is probably the best one that's ever been made. And uh, if you had an old CRT TV, it would probably work quite well. But, uh, and maybe there, are, and, and there are some flat panel TVs, especially older ones, they do not have wide gamut and do not have CMS that it might wor well work on. But um, practically in the modern era on a modern TV, you're, you're not going to have a filter that's going to work for setting color and tint. Um, so, so I was going to answer this question. Okay, I was just going to say this question about the which yeah. player would you recommend currently? So for an image quality standpoint, that would be the Panasonic 820 or 9000. They both use the same decoder. Uh, most other players actually use a MediaTek decoder. And even among them, there's differences. But the Pana, I mean, Panasonic, because of their chroma upsampling, it's actually a bicubic instead of bilinear. So it has a little bit of ringing in chroma. But beyond that, it, it's got the best image quality, I think, of the players. I mean, it's slow. It doesn't have source direct. Mm -hmm. So it's not a perfect player, but... Mm -hmm. There isn't one. I mean, would you recommend that over a used Oppo? Or Absolutely. A, you know? the Oppo, Oppos get um. Dolby Vision is broken on Oppo. Uh, yeah. Period. Like the levels will actually change on you. Mm. It, Oppo it, it enjoys this. Uh, they're good players. Don't get me wrong, but yeah. there's a there's no reason to uh, fetishize them the way they are when you can buy a Panasonic. You know? So, had this disc been out when Oppo was still in business? they would have got the issues fixed. Unfortunately, yeah. the disc came too late. But so the Oppo could play an image off hard drive, which is useful when you're actually creating a disc. And hard drive is so much faster than disc. Um, Oppo has source direct mode, which is great. And Oppos are fast. So those are the benefits. But for example, Oppo has different vertical and horizontal YC delay, depending on what you're doing. It's chroma upsampling. Remember I showed you has that sort of bug where you get these slashes in the chroma. That's a media tech yeah. issue. Oppo, uh, for example, in our specialty absolute patterns, if you bring up the pop-up menu, tone mapping turns back on. Does not do that on Panasonic. So it could the have been Oppos great. also have an issue with um, uh, HD resolution, HEVC content, where the chroma uh, has some pretty severe distortion. Yeah, that was the, that... If you look at our chroma diamonds, you'll see these huge stripes, striations through it. Yeah. We sometimes have to re-encode like a bonus feature for UHDBD release that um, was um, 1080i30 on the BD version, and UHDBD doesn't support it at the interlinked formats, so uh, we have to re-encode it as uh, 1080p 5994. We could upscale, I guess, but HEVC encoding is still slow. And uh, there are title there are some. There was one disc we did where uh, it has red text on the black background, and on the Oppo 
it's uh, there's weird stuff going on. So there, I mean, there's no perfect player. Uh, but I, I mean, I, I would agree personally. If I could only buy one, it would be the Panasonic. Um, it's you know, it's readily available for one thing. That always helps. And uh, the whole, the I mean, the Panasonic engineers, their whole philosophy was just correct. They never. I don't think. I, I think actually, I think some of the Panasonic BD players they would mess around with the picture in the default mode. But there's an off switch for more or less everything. Um, yeah, the, the fact that yeah, they're they're slow to respond to user input. That's really for 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 navigating a test disk, yeah. But for sitting there yeah. watching a movie, you're you know, <laughs> you're not going to yeah. care that it takes an extra two seconds to select the play film button in the menu. The only so, issue I've had from it being so slow is if I have it going through an AVR to an LG or whatever, and I try to play anything Dolby Vision, it fails the handshake because it's so slow. So one of the reasons we like, you know, when you go from a menu to a test pattern and back, especially in Dolby Vision, it takes so long to resync, which is why once you get to a pattern, you use the left and right arrows and it doesn't have to resync. Unless, of course, you change resolution or frame rate, like the color space eval pattern. So on this menu, you'll see a pattern called color temp. And at the top, you'll see a tab where it says optical comparator. Mm -hmm. So we actually spent around $5,000 building a prototype optical comparator that we want to include with the disc so that if you don't have a colorimeter you know, and spend the money, you would have a cheap optical comparator. Unfortunately, we just couldn't go in to work reliably at the price point we were trying to hit. And you would never ever, like I would, using these patterns would make you want to pull your hair out, but they're there if you just don't have the money and you have an optical comparator. Like a colorimeter is so much better at doing this in terms of just like the amount of work it takes to get this right. So the idea on this one is you've got the center, which is D65. So if you had an optical comparator, you would actually move it around to find the square that's the closest match. And then you could look at the top and the bottom and figure, or the top and the side and figure out exactly how far you are off. So you'd make the adjustments and it then should hopefully move that gray towards the center. And that was the idea. It does actually work. You could do it. <laughs> it's just, you would need a good optical comparator and- um, And patience. And patience, yeah. But can you go to the um, color temp pattern? Yeah. So no one's ever really had a good color temp pattern. We've all just used gray steps. Um, but you know, gray steps, if the whole thing turns red or the whole thing shifted blue, you really can't tell without an optical comparator. So I wanted something to try to give you a better idea. And when I described this pattern to Don, the first thing he said was, well, people will think it's backwards because the top is warm and the bottom is cool. And the numbers on the side sort of say the opposite. But that's not really the way you want to use the pattern. The idea is using an optical comparator, you find the row that matches the optical comparator or is closest. Then you look to the right and it tells you how far off you are in the other direction. So it means you need to move the other way, which is why it looks backwards. Yeah, you all need to tell Stacy that that's backwards from the way people are going to think about it. But <laughs> it's it's OK. I mean, it works. It is working. It is a working right. pattern. It's just that everybody is like, what? Yeah. And I think it's probably the first real big jump in a color temp pattern if you have a reference because it actually gives you useful information than just having an entire screen of gray steps. Um, and so if you do have the disc, you press down and it'll bring up uh, notes basically for each pattern. Pop-up help is back. Yeah. yeah. So here's where there's <laughs> a little we conflict. So discs one and two, you press the up arrow to get pop-up help. With disc three, we didn't have pop-up help, so we used the up arrow to do the configuration. So now we have both configuration and help so which do we, we still kept up arrow for configuration and down arrow for help. So it is slightly different than the first two discs in that regard. Oh I, yeah. For a second, I'm like, wait, what? Um, no, you, you mean the, the previous releases, not the yeah, yeah. So, set. <laughs> so if you look at this disc, it has a four on the spine and the previous HDR mm -hmm. disc has a three. And we've talk, talked about, you know, reprinting discs one and the first and second editions with a one and two and making a case to hold all four discs. If you had them, it's kind of a neat idea. Well, it's more than four discs. But well, four, four case, four products. Four SKUs, let's four say. Four SKUs, yeah. Because yeah. even the second edition had two discs. So uh, I'm going to have to go idea. here in a few minutes. Um, yep. Is I don't know if anybody has anything that they want to ask me that's in my wheelhouse. I'm pretty sure that Stacy can handle. Yeah. So any questions? Whatever um, he's, whatever Stacy says about me after I'm gone, you know, don't yeah. listen to that. That's yeah. it's lies. It's all lies. Well, are there other things that you wanted to ask as well about the disc? Uh, is there anything you want to point out or want me to show before you go? Go to advanced video. Let's see what's in there. 
Actually, there is some good stuff in there. Yeah. Um, I was going to mention the bias light setup real quick because I okay. can't. You can probably see I do have a media light around here, uh, which was also going to tell uh, lend me to say I have a link for the new disc from BiasLighting.com in the description of the stream. Um, so if you are interested in buying the disc, you, know, you follow the link and pick it up from there. And then there's a uh, bias light tool basically right here to set up your bias light if you would get one of those from bias lighting as well. Okay, so advanced video, and there's a lot of tabs. Okay, let's see. What is interesting here? So uh, let's go to PCA first which is perceptual contrast area. It's basically a way to measure backlight resolution. Oh, yeah. And we actually have a spreadsheet. We haven't put it on the website yet. But the idea is you measure white here, and then you measure, I think it's nine different black ones. And basically, the circle, the amount of white on screen stays constant. It's just the circle gets bigger, so it gets thinner. And with a spreadsheet, it will actually uh, spit out a number. The higher the number, the better. So it allows you to sort of measure different displays and get an absolute number from it or an objective yeah, So number. this will be good for anything with local dimming, which I have the uh, counter flagship, the QN95C here to review next. So that'll be the first display I get to use this on. Now, previously, they had a pattern which was basically, it was a window pattern, and then as it got farther apart, you had four squares that would head towards the corners. The problem with that pattern is a global dimming display could basically defeat it and report higher results than a full array local dimming display. And so this actually solves that problem. Um, the ADL patterns we modified based on customer feedback from the previous disk. So if you want to go to ADL, the next tab over. <laughs> Um, and Chrome John, thank you for the super chat real quick. Uh, or offer the C card to download for those who want to buy their own four disc case off Amazon. Um, not sure what you mean there. Well, we, the four disc case doesn't exist yet. We we want to yeah. design it and then offer the first two, and we do. So right now we're not selling on Amazon, and the reason is is people have treated Amazon as a rental service and they will literally use the disc and return it. And in some cases they won't return the disc. We received a horseshoe once and Amazon's response is, well, that they returned it. That's all that counts. <laughs> so anyways, play the 3% on, for example. So on the previous disc, we would actually have actually uh, go back to the menu. Let's do one. It's a lot busier. Do 25% on. And so the previous disc, Don spent a lot more time making this more pretty. Uh, the problem was it would actually have uh, boxes to the left, right, above and below the center box. And there's some displays where you'll get streaking, and that streaking could impact the results. So now there's nothing on, on the sides, on top and bottom. Yeah, this was a big pain to figure out exactly <laughs> how to build this so that it you know, it looked reasonable, but it actually did the job it was supposed to do, you know, which is to have 25% of the screen lit um, and then have this target in the center that would not be affected um, in ways that you care about by the other light on the screen. So it's really just supposed to tell you how other, you know, other brightness on the screen affects the reading off the center. It shouldn't change, you know, like, whether it's 1% or 3% or 25% of extra light, it shouldn't change the center. But in fact, of course, on any, on almost all real world technologies, it does in fact affect the measurement, both because of, uh, you know, things like internal reflection, reflection off the walls and so forth, but also just, you know, the power supply um, getting, you know, having to do more work on direct lit things like OLEDs, um, you know, it, it provides a very interesting way to see how loading the screen more and more and more affects the brightness of another patch of the screen. Right. So what we were planning to do is if we did a four disc case, we'd actually include a new cover for discs one and two that have the number on the spine would be our, D, our ID. I mean, we could offer one, I guess, to print out as well. <laughs> So I have a uh, C9 and a CX. I'm planning to get a G3, a 77 G3 for my bedroom. I have a G2 and I have an LG, the last LG that had 3D, which C6. I don't use for my primary TV. But since I do stereoscopic photography, I want to have at least one 3D TV. And I have an enormous collection of uh, projectors. 
but the thing I watch TV on is a G2. So let's go to panel. Okay. Um, and before you go, Don, uh, one question I also had, um, kind of going back towards what Sony likes to say about their processing that can't be disabled. And David, I, I really liked what you said at the projector shootout um, when you were looked at, there was all kinds of artifacts on the screen and someone had brought up, um, I think the guy doing the MC was um, saying, a little sharpness doesn't hurt or whatever. And you're like, no, it should just be the signal. Right. Um, so when you are looking at, say, a sharpness pattern or something and you are seeing artifacts, but then when you go to the real content, which is Sony's argument that you don't see the artifacts, it just looks better. That's, you know, what is your Well, in, in a, in a um, I, I can understand especially in a three chip projection setup those typically because of you know you you're not looking it's it's very different to a direct view tv you know you have three images in there and a lens and all of that is going to impact your sharpness a little bit i'm totally not against um compensating for the loss. right comp well, compensating and, uh, it's, it's, it's almost like eq in an audio system right i'm not against like boosting the high frequencies a little bit to like uh, to to perceptually uh, compensate for a little bit of loss in sharpness. I, they're completely correct, actually. I agree entirely with them. My point is, you should be able to turn it off. Yeah. Um, if if you find, I, I'm sorry, but I just don't want to buy a, an expensive piece of gear uh, and not be able to have you know control of it because um, yep. it, inevitably, if it shows up in a pattern, it will eventually show up in content. Now, do you, you could argue you would have to go looking for it. You know, it, okay, fine. But, well, you want at least um, the option. option, option you know. you yeah, want the I think that, not that have any processing. That's our point with the sharpness pattern. Is if the sharpness pattern, if you see artifacts in that pattern, it will show up in content at some point. And whether or not you'll notice it, and whether or not it'll bother you, that's another question. But the whole point is, you want to know what level of sharpness, what setting of sharpness, is going to get you an image that looks, you know, appropriate from your seating position. And my position has always been that sharpness is a perceptual thing. Um, at your seating position, there is a sharpness setting that is gonna produce the sharpest reasonable image that does not show uh, overt um, artifacts. And th in theory, I kind of agree with what David is saying that off would be the most appropriate uh, setting when you have content that is absolutely one-to-one -one pixel mapped. I just think that in reality, there's all, often a lot of content that is not really perfectly one-to-one -one pixel map. And in practice, some amount of sharpening is kind of inevitable. So you should have the amount of sharpening that gives you the best picture that doesn't have visible artifacts. And that's really the point of our sharpening. Our instructions are basically, because you can't know what is effectively you know, neutral, all you can really do is sit at your uh, viewing location, turn sharpness up so far that you see clear and unambiguous artifacts, and then pull it down, sort of watching the artifacts slowly di disappear. And, you know, especially looking at the things like diagonals, circles, um, anti-aliased lines and so forth, that's much more, that's a very realistic um uh, thing to, to look for sharpness. Real world content really does have um, hard lines in it. And of course, on a real camera, those will be naturally anti aliased. Um, so the really, really hard single, you know, pixel on off stuff, that is very hard for a sharpness algorithm to deal with. Yeah. But those diagonals and stuff, you really shouldn't see significant artifacts visible from your seating position. If you do, yeah. there's too much sharpening going on. So on my, the camera uh, my side... My point on that was just, just gives the option to turn it off, not necessarily that it's bad yes. practice. So let me give you a couple examples on the projector side. So uh, if you had a 1080p DLP, which was true 1080p, it does, I mean, it really, if the lens is good, it doesn't really have any loss. You will see the sharpness in the content, whereas LCOS has this natural roll off that I find really, really soft. And so you might want to boost the sharpness on an L cost to recover some of the loss that you get. Yeah, I, yeah, I didn't the, mean uh, for the- You wouldn't flat recover panel, though. You would, you would perceptually you would compensate percept for Yeah, perceptually it. compensate. But, Whereas, yeah. but a flat panel, I mean, an OLED flat panel, it doesn't have a roll off. It is sharp. On the camera right. side, there are digital cinema cameras that don't have a low pass filter other than the lens itself. Uh, the camera I work on happens to have a low pass filter and some others do, but there's some big ones that don't. And so they can look sharper, but if you if you shoot a zone play chart, you will see aliasing on, on those cameras. 
yeah, on the so point the, of what um, you're seeing... Sony, sorry, so the point of Sony projectors and uh, the shootout, um, I, I think there was one pattern that was revealing a lot of colored uh, artifacts, and I think the reason for that actually is um, uniformity, the, the, the way the uniformity correction for the Elkos panels um, interacts with fine details. I don't think that was actually... Uh, well, it's um, a three chip, right? So you got panel alignment as well and right but also be, beyond um like I, I think it was a setting that wasn't necessarily exposed to the user that was that was causing mm. well, e even on the sony tvs i mean if you put this up um it, it almost looks like what you're seeing now whereas right now the it's messed up because of the camera as i see it in person on the tv everything's clean and kind of how it should be um, but on the sony tvs by default in the cinema or custom mode or whatever where you can't really turn everything off it is you know, kind of, it's not as sharp and deep as it should be because of the processing. But so again, you go into graphics mode and it fixes it. On this pattern, the magenta <laughs> wagon wheel in the lower right-hand corner, when the Oppo has that chroma artifact that we talked about earlier, it shows up on that chroma wagon wheel. Yeah, I'm going to have to go. All right. uh, thank Thanks you so coming. much for having me. Uh, it's great talking to you. Great to meet you. And, uh, I uh, will let Stacy, you know, tell terrible stories about me. <laughs> well, thanks for being here. Yeah. So, can you go How's to panel? Yeah. Let's see. How do we get out of here? <laughs> You're uh, stuck. Leave studio <laughs> at the bottom. <laughs> Hit what? Leave studio at the bottom. Of the uh, I Move your mouse. mouse. Full screen first. Exit yeah. full screen. Then I can leave studio. All right. Now. <laughs> So let's start with the uh, interesting. We call the panel aging. It's pixel age. Yeah, whatever. So let's start with the panel aging pattern. Do we call it panel aging on both discs or now? I don't remember. I always <laughs> is, call this, it, is this is this what we're going to find out? It's inconsistent between. The I always two. call it pixel aging. So, hmm. so this I think pattern it's panel on both. This pattern was designed to age the panel, um, but it's very unique. So right now it looks pretty messy. And all breaking up. Oh, this is uh, sorry to sorry to yeah, but in it's overloading the encoder and the streaming. So that's in reality, this runs at um, sixty uh, frames per 60 second. Sixty frames per second. Um, but right now, we're it looks like uh, you know we're getting like something like ten. It's really confusing the codec, the camera. Yeah, I just paused it. Okay, there so if you look at this pattern right now, um, it may not seem like it, but if you were to take all those pixels, squish them together, it would be the size of a ten percent area pattern. That's all the pixels wow. that are activating on any one frame. So the, the, we wanted a pattern that would equally age a, a panel. So every pixel, red, green, blue, and white, will be touched one time and only one time uh, before all pixels are touched. And it takes about 40 frames to do that. So every second you touch every pixel about one and a half times, just approximately. It's What's encoded. also funny about this is if you uh, hit fast forward or rewind, which will force the player to only show the iframes, which is one every six, one every sixty frames, one every second, um, the dots won't actually move, right? I don't know. I've never fast that's forwarded. What I, that's that's what I always saw. So if you <laughs> um, if you hit fast forward, or maybe maybe different players do it differently, but you if you're in actual like not just uh, stop frame, but actual fast forward mode. It just looks like a static pattern with some of the colors changing. Instead Are we in fast forward right now? That's exactly yeah. what it's, I never noticed yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah. So, so I guess uh, I guess every second, every every one second, the dots return to their home position. Is that right? So we wanted this pattern as lossless as possible. So it is encoded at QP0. In order to do that, given that it looks like random noise, uh, every block long, I think they're eight by eight pixels that land on a block boundary. So no pixel values ever cross over a block for better compression. Uh, each one of these pixel values is a code value 940. So you're getting the maximum brightness the pixel can produce. And as I said, it's 10% area. So it'd be the equivalent of measuring a 10% area test pattern if you could. Mm -hmm. So we wanted, because that's usually the brightest point of a display, at least when they measure for their peak mm -hmm. luminance marketing. Yeah, so what was interesting was the um, FOMO had this and he used it on this TV and the G3. The G3 saw it as a paused image because the uh, APL isn't changing at all. It's always consistent. So over you know four minutes or whatever, it would then dim down. And I've sent that feedback to LG, so I'm hoping they can improve the algorithm because they did move the control right in the service menu, so you have to go somewhere else to disable the feature. Uh, technically, there's no easy consumer way to get to it anymore. 
I thought there was still there. It's just you had to know where to look. It's there, but it's not accessible unless you uh, like no, use the, the col color control or other ways or have a USB key or things like that. Okay. But anyways, this pattern was designed to, bake, to basically age your TV for 100 hours or 240, I guess, on the, the mm -hmm. MLA. And then the other pattern that I really like here, which you've been using a lot, and I'm happy mm -hmm. to see that, is the peak luminance pattern. Yep. Uh, so display manufacturer, well, everyone has always used a 10% area window that's 100% in luminance. And for the UHD Alliance, the way it's done is they'll measure the center for a certain period of time, they'll move it to the right, and then back to the left, back to the center in order to allow the, the LEDs to cool down so they can get a higher measurement out of this. And so in a way that's sort of cheating. So you might get one of those, you might measure with that pattern and a display manufacturer might hit 1500 nits, but you put it this pattern where the background, the synthetic background is modeled after real world content to represent, you know, to give you sort of real world material. And I made the circle in the center as small as possible that a Klein K10 could work on a 48 inch display. Cause at the time there was a 48 inch OLED. Yeah, I keep getting a lot of uh, questions asking if this can be done with a with different sizes of the circle to represent different sized highlights uh, in different content. Well, again, I wanted the circle as small as I could be so I could use the Klein since I, you know, the Klein and the uh, colorimetry researcher are really the best meters to use for this. So yeah. the software that generated this can generate a circle at any size and then it adjusts the background to compensate for it, though. Yeah, because so, I mean, specifically, they're asking for larger circles to show like then it'll so be dimmer. Yeah, it'll be dimmer, but and then it's like, well, do you want it ten percent larger or thirty percent larger? Yeah. Like, the, basically, at that point. But at this point, the whole point is the background is to yeah. is to basically it's try to it's more representative of real world content than a static ten yeah. percent window is. So I just at least saw. It shows... uh, sorry, I was just to say, I just saw a comment where uh, James Campbell says digital codec brought down by Snow LMAO, but um, <laughs> that's actually random. The way these codecs work though is with um, exploiting temporal redundancy, so. Uh, a constantly moving like fuzzy pattern. That's the hardest thing in the world to encode. Which, and again, the way we designed it with to get QP zero, I mean, you shouldn't get QP zero with something that looks like random noise. I see there's a star field medium. Is that brighter so, or? Um, it's more stars. More, more so stars. that existed on the previous disc. It was just all in one clip. So you had to wait longer to get to it. And so there's, I think there's four versions of stars in each one. So the star field low, and so with one particular gamma curve or transfer function, and then there's the same one again, except where we put a logo on screen. Uh, so when we were talking to some people at ILM, we were talking about uh, Rogue One was coming out at the time. And we were talking about how great a star field looked on an OLED, but they had pointed out as soon as the Star Wars logo comes up, the stars dim. So we wanted something to, to recreate that. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, then we do it with a different sort of transfer function, which is why the stars will be brighter. So you've got two with one transfer, two with the other, with minimal amount of stars and with more stars. Uh, this is probably my favorite motion test. And with this test I found on this TV, if you have the clarity menu off, like you think that you know you would normally want, um, randomly every, I don't know, three, five seconds, whatever, I don't know how well it's going to show up on the camera. It'll break it up. It will either stutter or artifacts or do something when the clarity menu is off. But if you turn it on and set it to zero, zero, <laughs> then it's smooth and there's no problem. That's weird. But that's a good find. Mm -hmm. Now, have there's you looked so at many things like that in displays for the GUI lies to you? So have you looked at Sarah on a hammock and see what happens when you turn on the motion compensation, like the hundred, the filmmaker, the soap opera okay. stuff? Let's see. And I should explain so, that because David keeps bringing up how this Sarah is different than the one that on the Meridia generator. So we pan the camera too fast. And so if you ran the 24p version, it was just panning too fast. So we took the 60p version and we just played it back at 24p. So it's slower. And then for 60p, what we did is we simply took the same one and we just doubled, we repeated every frame twice. And that gives me the desired effect I want. So I get the motion I want. So when you turn on uh, like the soap opera mode, if you look at the, the back of the pebble background in mm -hmm. between the it's... ropes, you'll see this blur move back and forth. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's not coming through on the camera, but in person, yeah. if you do this. And but when you when you enable it, right, her shirt, you can actually see the the, the lines in her shirt. They're nice and clear, yeah. just like when you pause. So the yeah. idea here is the contents clean and any blur you're seeing is caused by the display yeah. and the motion compensation really falls apart, which, again, it's hard to tell here because you've got the streaming compression on top of it. Yeah. By the way, how did you find a shirt that looks like a test pattern? So first, remember the FPD disc? Yeah. They had the same shirt, but it was in color. 
And so I, right. I found this shirt on eBay, but I went, okay. and I went and bought every striped shirt I could find. And this one turned out to be my favorite because you had different thicknesses of the black and white stripes to make it look like a, a, a multiverse pattern. I love the shirt. In fact, it's on a mannequin head around here somewhere. <laughs> Okay, so uh, what I think I'm going to do now, um, since we are going to be ending relatively soon, uh, do you want to go through, for the average person, they buy the disc, where should they start, what should they go to, what can they adjust? Because I know a lot of this is for professional calibrators, a lot of this is for evaluators, uh, studios, not everything here is for the average buyer. So in a perfect world, the video setup menu would be a single disc for the very beginner because other than an optical comparator, you don't really need any uh, equipment to use it. You could set your basic picture controls, brightness, contrast, color tint, sharpness, uh, grayscale with the, or color temp with the menu. So that's your basic disc. You wanna go back to the menu? So I can. Then if you were a calibrator, this uh, the next disc would be the video setup menu plus the analysis menu, which are all your window test patterns. So that's two discs. Now, if you're a reviewer then or a display manufacturer, that's where the advanced video section comes in because these patterns are all about evaluation. You know, what, what, what are the capabilities of the display? And the problem is, is you might sell, uh, reviewers generally don't pay for things, so they would get it for free. There's, you know, a handful of display manufacturers, so they'd pay $50,000 a disc because you would sell like five copies of the disc. Uh, so that's sort of the trouble. And then of course you'd have to pay David uh, a certain sum of money to author each one of the discs separately. So it's just not cost effective to make all these different discs. So instead we basically have to build a disc for all markets at once. The problem there is, is someone who's a very beginner, they might get frustrated with all the advanced content because they don't know what to do with it. When really that, to them that's just bonus material. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. So with the package as it is, um, so like in the question, you know, can you do two point, so basically 30, 70 IRE yeah. for so HDR to, and SDR? So if you go to the analysis section, yeah. under grayscale, here you've got all your, um, you could do them when windows or fields. So you can I have like your, that uh, one, two, three, and four is added. So the reason we went with these these 1% down at the lower level was really for SDR, for gamma, because you need more points down there. And so this this section, so there's a slight difference between this section on SDR and HDR. You don't have candelas per meter squared on the SDR disc, but the SDR disc has a whole lot more color checker patterns. This menu was really modeled after the quick analysis tools in CalMan. I wanted to try to cover everything they had, but we added like candelas per meter squared, which I thought was interesting. They don't offer. Uh, which one was the red on the Samsung? That's not right. Was it? The okay. So let's one? go, let's play 2020 first and play the red pattern okay. just so they can see it. I got to change oh. the camera. Hang on. Okay. It looks kind of orange here. That's close. Yeah, that's, that'll that's, give you that'll give you an idea. Yeah. So this, you know, so if you play this pattern on a Sony display, on the LG display in HDR10, or on any display in Dolby Vision, it'll look like this. Actually, they, all displays play this correctly. Mm -hmm. Now let's go to either the P3 versions. Well, it's not as bad here, but it really is the wrong it's color. In, pers in person, it's a lot more yellowish orange, whereas previously it was reddish orange. And Stacy, is this one of the patterns where if you press up, you can change the gamut while it's playing? You don't have to go back to the top menu, do you? Or, okay, this one is only the Yeah, no, one. we didn't do that on this one. Be another, so, another variable. So on, on Sony and LG in HDR10 or any display in Dolby Vision, this pattern displays correctly on JVC, on Samsung, on BenQ, and another one, it displays these patterns wrong. Now, this pattern is 100% stimulus and 100% saturation. If we go to the saturation sweeps menu, Basically, the 100% red here would be still 100% saturation, but it's only 58% stimulus. And in which case, all the displays show it correctly. So there's something about raising the stimulus level up that causes it to display the wrong color. But the other pattern should have looked more like this. Okay. 
Now, if you have software like Kalman or any other display calibration, any other pattern gen software, you can actually change the stimulus levels and uh, you could probably find the point where it changes and breaks. But it's sort of a corner case. But gamut should be measuring the edge of the gamut. All right. So from the you know this oh. menu, what would you say average person who buys a disc doing stuff by eye? Uh, what should they do and what order should they do it in? I know there's a booklet that explains a lot of this. Um, so we put the patterns in the order you should use them in. Now, one thing that... Uh, so the reason, the way the pattern works, you're not looking at the patterns top down. You're looking at the patterns uh, left to right, then top down. So it's brightness, mm -hmm. contrast, color, temp. The way we did it this way is because when you're actually playing a pattern, you use the left and right arrows to go to the patterns. So if you're on this pattern, you just you press right, it's going to take you to contrast, which is why mm -hmm. it's in that order on the menu. Yeah. And this one should be completely dark room. <laughs> so. On this pattern, you'll never see the two left bars in HDR. Mm -hmm because of HDR, the way HDR works, but you will see them in SDR. Um, oh yeah, and it's currently in HDR 10 plus, so it's tone mapping. Yeah, so if you go to HDR 10 mode, which I think you can do from the pop-up menu here, yeah. and you can also choose the knit level. So start at 1,000, for example. So the way we did this pattern is if you set it to 1,000, it's only gonna go up to code value 723. Now it shows 722, but the background itself is the 723. So you need it to be one code value more. So this is showing you on a th that if you can resolve a thousand nits fully, and then if you play the four thousand nit version, that'll actually switch to eight fifty five, and so on and so forth. So we wanted to limit how high they went. Now the HDR ten plus and the Dolby Vision always show up to code value nine forty because they're dynamic tone mapped, yeah. or intended to be. So yeah, so it's eight fifty four with the background being eight fifty five, and we put dots. So you'll see a dot there. I think it's, yeah, the seven eighty nine. Yeah, and then the dot mm -hmm. down low. But that was to basically signify the six three fifty six hundred one thousand two thousand. So you know they have a, a certain meaning. Okay. Can you put in disc three? I think that's one thing we didn't. That's where all the audio tests are. Okay. And it's got the same menu, so we can you know go back to this as well. So David, tell us about authoring it. Was this the easiest <laughs> disc you've ever authored or what? This, um, it's so weird to say it was one of the most frustrating projects I've ever worked on because it is obviously not because of you or not, <laughs> but um, we, we, pushed, uh, we pushed the authoring tools that exist past their absolute limits. Um, well, and the format supports 9,999 files and we, don't even, we have half that. So yeah, so the the, the authoring software for um, uh, BD and by extension UHD BD, most uh, there it's it's a smaller field now. Um, most facilities are using Scenarist, uh, which we are, um, and it works brilliantly for authoring a disc. That, a, a typical movie that has maybe you know twenty thirty elements on the disc, you know, copyright warnings, a movie, trailers, bonus features, that kind of thing. Um, but this is obviously not your typical disc. Um, it has so many different elements on it that we started finding that the authoring software after a certain uh, while would not be able to save the project. Um, so there was a time in the development of the new Spurs and Munsell where um, we, uh, I had my main authoring workstation uh, up and running for about two and a half months without a restart. Um, because we couldn't save the project file. We could, we could muck the disk correctly, like generate the output files that go to the replicator. Um, but after a certain while, um, we, we wouldn't be able to save. Um, the, I mean, how many, you can tell me probably, I, I did the math on this. I think it's something like 5,000 individual elements on this. Mm -hmm. When you can set all the tests, all the test patterns, and uh, you know, we have them in uh, HDR10. There's it's about eight Windows versions models. of each, I think. About eight versions of each. And the other thing you have to remember is that in um, the the adding the Dolby Vision base layer and then the enhancement layer for every clip that doubles it. Uh, not doubles the. You know, it, it adds it adds every pattern again on there for the Dolby Vision enhancement layer. Um, you also have stuff like menus, um, little files that run in the background that the user won't be aware of. Those are an element too. So once you get past a certain point, um, it, it, it just got beyond what uh, existing Blu-ray disc authoring tools could do. Uh, and we had to come up with some pretty convoluted workarounds to, uh, 
what, what I say it was hard to get all this onto one disk, I don't mean in terms of file size. I mean, just in terms of um, essentially Frankensteining a whole bunch of different authoring projects together to make one cohesive whole. Because normally you author one project for one disk. Right. And this right. first yeah, disk yeah, is somewhere between seven and nine projects. Seven and nine projects, because eventually we stop being able to save. And what we would have to do is, um, yeah, no, normally it's it's a very, you know, simple process like you, you have your sonaris project you go in there you bring in all your assets you arrange them into clips and playlists and add programming uh, code and stuff like that and then you uh multiplex the whole disk that generates your bdmv and certificate and stream folders and everything that goes off to the replicator they glass master it job done in this case um because we'd uh, we'd found that there, it, there was just too much there uh, you know, too many different formats, too many different clips. Um, we uh, had to break it down into little mini projects and then manually um, take all the output folders and mash them together. And of course, when you do that, you have to come with like a whole bunch of workarounds because, you know, uh, the, the project that the top menu is in won't be able to see any of the clips or playlists. And, uh, you know, the analysis section in its own project won't know that the video setup and the audio and the advanced video sections are there. So we had to do things like manually assign, oh, I wrote a script to do it, but uh, manually assign all the clip numbers. You know, that's when you go into the stream folder in a disk and you have the clips that start at zero and go up to nine, 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 nine. Um, you know, manually assign all those so that um, there wouldn't be any collisions between the different projects. Um, and then once that was all done, we had to find a way to actually wrap it into a, a CMF image uh, so that it could actually go to the replicator and they could feed it into into glass mastering. So and we're lucky we we're able to get that tool because where's that person located? Yeah, that's that's thanks to DVD Logic who are in Ukraine, um, and we were able to use their their tool. Um, uh, take the whole uh, finessed, finished folder structure and turn it into an image the Sony DVC could replicate onto a disk. So uh, this was not this this was not birthed easily. <laughs> and we way. showed the first version of this, the Value Electronics Shootout, in 2021, October yeah, 21. That's right. Because we thought we were right. pretty close at that time, and so <laughs> here we are, a yeah, year and a half later. Um, it was uh, the final. The final project was um, the the folder structure. There's like a, a, I wrote a batch script that like pulls little bits from here and there in the various pieces and crams it all together. And um, uh, yeah, it it it. But, and we we restarted authoring on a couple of times to try and find ways to work around the the the, the, just the limitations. But, right, because at first you did a pattern per title, and you thought that might be the problem. Right. We, yeah. we had different theory and there was no, yeah, when, when you have a bug like that, you can't quite easily replicate. Um, you can't even easily reproduce it. You you think you might have come up with a solution. There was a little while where I thought if you um, hit the save icon soon after making changes, you've got a little window of time to, to, to work. It will actually write it to disk and you can recall it. But, you know, at that point, like you're, you're, it's, uh, you're, you're, your head's probably playing games with you. So, so uh, this disk is almost a duplicate of the first disk, but it's SDR 709 and SDR 2020. I mean, there are some differences, like this one have HDR specific test patterns, but all of the audio test tones, so for levels and uh, bass management and rattle tests, they're all on this disk. And so on this config menu, we have the base layer where you select, if you have a 5.1, 7.1 or 9.1 layout, and then a mm -hmm. two, four or six height speaker. So we default to 7.1.4. Now, if we go to uh, audio section, and we'll demonstrate this. And then go ahead and press enter here on base layer. So this is your 7-1 layout. Now, while you're on this menu, if you press the right arrow, you go clockwise around the room and left arrow will go counterclockwise around the room. And instead of pop-up help, the help's actually on the left of the screen. So this is set to 7-1. Now let's go back to the config menu. Now, and the reason it's on the config menu is generally you have one setup and you're only gonna change this once at the start of the disk. And unfortunately, this is one of the things you can't save with BDMV, whereas you need to use BDJ. So go ahead and change this to 9.1. Yeah, there's no uh, Java code anywhere on these disks. Um, it's kind of pushing HDMV, uh, which is the uh, more basic, but still very capable scripting language on Blu-ray. It certainly um, loads a lot faster. That's true, yes, and there are no yeah. um, player-specific niggles either. 
So now we're in a 7.1 layout and we now have the wide channels. In fact, we should go back and show 5.1 because the 5.1 actually puts surround speakers in a different position. And so we did try to honor that with the UI. Yeah, I have a 5.1.2. Uh, okay, so let's, yeah, let's do your setup. Because I think even on the height speakers, there's a difference between two and four as well. Or the center speakers on one of them, I forget. And so now I believe the speakers are actually in a different position in the rear based on Dolby standard for the 517191 layout. Yeah, that's how mine are, essentially, anyway, because the couch is you know, a foot from the wall, and that's how I had to have them. <laughs> yeah. And now let's go back to the panning section. I think that's worth showing. So obviously, this is where you, you, know, you set your individual levels. And then the panning is where you can sort of demonstrate. And let's do, so we've got three circular pans. These are pans that go around the room. Base layer means it only pans around the speakers on the floor, top around the top. And then base and top is the one I really like. And so what this one is, this one will actually pan around the room, but it's it goes from the floor to the ceiling back to the floor as it moves around. So it starts off five seconds in the front left, and then it moves. This is really useful because the way um, Atmos is implemented, uh, it's very easy to think you're getting Atmos but, or, or DTSX, I imagine, and you're not. Um, there's you, you can make a wrong setting in the AV receiver or have the player set to output PCM audio, um, and you will not be getting anything out of, or any real content out of your, your rear speakers. So uh, I'm actually surprised that um, maybe they do. Maybe I just I'm, I'm not aware of it. I'm actually surprised this kind of test is not on um, you know studio movie titles to make sure that you're actually the users actually getting what they paid for. Now this graphics Brian created in After Effects, and the and the one thing he couldn't do is a drop shadow on the floor, which would I think been it, it would help you a lot as it comes to the back. But it is actually in fact in the right spot. It can just be misleading given the angle you're looking at. And, it's, and you have the same thing for a diagonal. You can go from top diagonal to top left, top left diagonal to right rear diagonal, or you can go top left base through the, the ceilings back down to the right rear and vice versa. Okay. And so these are nice because you'll set the individual speaker levels, but then once you have it panned around the room, you may have to tweak so that way the volume doesn't change as it pans. And then for the rattle test, we only put it in the center channel with the assumption that if, you, if any of your speakers are small that will engage the sub, it will be the center channel. And so we have a 500 hertz to is it 200 hertz, and then two down to one figure, something like that. And so you'll actually see it slowly count down at what the frequency is of what, of what it's playing at the time. Which this is you useful. Actually, then. It just reminded me of another little uh, geeky offering side. Um, we found um, quite late into development that, um, so the, the, the way the patterns are implemented, any, any static pattern, which is really like two or four frames or whatever, just has a pause command on it. But anything that any motion pattern, um, you uh, we would ideally have it just loop forever and ever. But actually, what happens is eventually it will advance on to the next pattern unless you go to your player and tell it to repeat the chapter or whatever. Um, and we we ran into this bug where it was a completely non-specific error message, like object instance not set to instance of an object or something. And eventually, um, I found out that with the Dolby Vision um, clip, you couldn't loop it more, or in, in the entire playlist, you couldn't loop a Dolby Vision asset more than 255 times. Um, we hit up against some kind of 8-bit register there. Um, so yeah, we, 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 we discovered things like that through a lot of trial and error. That's why if you actually look at the total length of some of the playlists, um, the uh, Dolby Vision ones run a little shorter, are actually cumulatively by a couple of hours shorter than the HDR10 and 10 plus ones, just down to the way it's implemented on the, the format. So good to your good point. So when you're playing the panel aging pattern, you actually want to set the player to loop that pattern as well, so it will never leave it. Actually, no. I seem to remember that that one's in its own playlist because it's a different frame rate. So I th and did we did we do it that way? Camera. I think that one actually will loop forever because okay. I didn't want someone to um, have it go uh, back to the menu when they're not there and burn. The right. Display. I didn't. I didn't want. Right. I didn't want someone to play on their their new OLED TV and then go on vacation and come back and find that it moved on to the the montage of the horses. Um, yeah, it's too bad there stuff. wasn't a way to have it auto shut off after five or six hours for a compensation cycle and then come back on. So uh, AV Sync. I'm glad you're here. So on the previous disc, everything was. Ultra HD resolution and 23976. Um, however, we realize that different frame rates can impact 
AV sync as well as scaling. So if you actually have to scale from HD to UHD, that might actually add latency in the video side. So you want to be able to test all these different combinations. Um, for the question on screen about doing uh, PC monitors, I mean, I would say uh, hopefully so, it has HDMI would probably be the best way to run the. But if as far as using a disc player uh, on PC, I, I have a UHD disc player, but I haven't used it yet. So Don and I worked on Direct Show and Media Foundation, the media platforms on Windows. And so we know where all the warts are, at least from back then. And so neither of us will use a PC to play our video content. So <laughs> basically a dedicated player will is usually better. I mean, and anytime so the problem with the computer is anytime there's a graphics driver change, they can break the levels. So there are times where they're outputting limited range and then they might break it and they'll do full range, or they might have head into a room, then the next firmware or next driver update they might not. So it's hard and with modern Windows, for example, it it is hard to turn off auto updates unless you completely disconnect it from the, the network. Yeah, we recently found that um, the most recent Windows update breaks uh, support for LTO tape drives. So I have a bunch of machines here that have a Windows update. Um, uh, yeah, it's hard to turn it off. <laughs> well, and so actually, uh, well, not quite a PC, but it is, is the Xbox. And right. since I came from that team and uh, I worked on the, the, the Blu-ray disc player for, on the Xbox One before UHD, I'm still good friends with everyone on the team. And so we found bugs with this disc. And uh, they fixed it before. I think they shipped an update to the player before the disc came to market. And so anytime there's a bug, and occasionally David will find one, we report it to them, to the right people, and they fix it. So we're not going through support. We're going to the guy that runs the team. So it's worked out really well. So as you can see, a lot of the same patterns, although on this disc, we actually have the skin tones that actually fits on this disc. And then there's also a gamma section that might be worth showing uh, the next menu over. So this one, there's two different style of gamma patterns. First, there's the combined pattern, which has every possible, you wanna start with the combined? So this one can be overwhelming because you also have HDR, the transfer function on here, not really gamma, but, and so the idea is you can look all the way across, find the gammas and find the one where there's, where it's basically blends with the blinking, where, where you don't see the blinking and that gives you an idea what the gamma is, but also at different levels. It's not just a single gamma point. The gamma can change at different levels. And so this is all of them on screen at once. And then if you press the right arrow, you'll actually see one gamma at a time. So this is 1.9 and, and for consumer home video, it should be 2.4, which is also be, on, an, on an OLED 2.4 and 1886 are the same because there's no offset because black is black. On an LCD, there's an offset to give you the same, to try to present the same thing. Yeah, my uh, this TV is like 2.34 or something. It's right in between 2.3 and 2.4. Yeah, 2.4, you can't see anything. And so this is this is the type of pattern that won't work on a Sony display, and maybe unless you're in graphics mode, I'll have to try that because of, the, of some processing they're doing that's all that's actually altering the single pixels. Because inside of each one of these blocks is a little checkerboard that blinks on and off. It's the same thing on our color space eval pattern at the top, where we call it EOTF tracking. The other thing to point out with regard to playing uh, UHD BD on a um, PC, it's frankly a miserable experience. I seem to remember, well, what, you can't get Dolby Vision for one. I don't think any players, any software player supports that. And also there was all this uh, utter nonsense about it only working on Intel machines with the SGX extensions, which I think Intel stopped supporting. So when that happened, uh, all these tech sites put out these articles saying, you won't be able to watch Blu-rays on the computer ever again. And actually, it turns out, no, this only affected 4K Blu-ray. And I don't think anyone was really doing that to start with. Um, so, yeah. Can you go back uh, to the analysis menu real quick? Yeah. I want to show a couple of things there. So some differences between the SDR disk and the HDR disk. So on the HDR disk, we had candles per meter squared, uh, but we didn't have luminance sweeps. So luminance sweeps is only on the SDR disk and candelas per meter squared is on the HDR. Also under grayscale and uh, on the grayscale, there's three different pattern types. So not only do you have field and window, we're back to the equal energy window. So if you do equal energy window, the idea here is no matter which pattern you're playing, it's constant. The APL is constant. 
So this was useful on a plasma, for example. So the idea is whichever is in the center, it has a black, it, it's replacing the black rectangle you see. And so if you press the right arrow to go to the next pattern, you'll see the black rectangle move and the center will change. So right now the A pale is not changing, it's constant. I found, I remember when we authored the first disc, um, there's certain patterns uh, where the LG OLEDs will uh, kind of adjust what they're doing. Like, I think it's one that has a lot of like on off pixel transitions on it. And uh, when just when you load the pattern, it's like the LG like zooms in and zooms out. It does something strange. It's like, it's like the display is actively monitoring the content <laughs> and switching gears. Do they still do that? Do they still have that? I, I don't think, it, I think it was fine once it's settled, but um, start it, at the top one. Unexpected stuff. Start at one three three, and this is a good case again demonstrating the right arrow. So as you're looking at anyone, just press the right arrow, and you, you'll see the aspect ratio change as it switches patterns, and you can just keep going through them. Yeah, going back to uh, sharpness setting for a second, what I do is um, I have a jeweler's loop. And I'll just put this on one of the rounded numbers, like if there's a zero or a two, and then turn it all the way down and then turn it up until you start to see pixel change and then go back one. Yeah, I have this little loop here myself. And mm -hmm. so the chroma alignment diamonds, especially at UHD resolution, you need to use a loop to look at them. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go to, what were we just looking at? Aspect. Aspect, go to evaluate. Is there new motion stuff to talk about? Or is it the same, all the same motion stuff aside from the different frame rate? So we add, for the stock ticker, we added a true 24. So all these patterns are 23976 mm -hmm. and it was 124 because mm -hmm. I think it was Xbox One, which can't do true 24. It's always 23976. So you'll see a periodic glitch. But here we added some additional. So on the previous disc, we just had the quantization rotate YCBCR. Now we've got it in RGB and cyan magenta yellow. We've got the 2D uh, CB and CR steps, and we added the Sarana hammock back. Okay. And let's um, see. Um, try evaluation. There was something. So this is where SDR and HDR is different. The clipping patterns are different. On this one, this one has a few more just because clipping is different. Oh, so on the video setup, you have the color and tint pattern with the blinking boxes because mm -hmm. some people want a blinking. On this section, the color and tint blue, which is that same pattern, doesn't blink. So you get it both ways. Uh, question for the clipping. Is that to uh, legal 235 or does it go to 255? It would go, well, it would go to 1019. Uh, okay, so this pattern... Yeah, so this pattern was very special because this was designed back in the day when there was a bug in the silicon image HDMI transmitter, where if you use their um, their color conversion built into the chip, it would actually clip in YCBCR to code value 240, then convert to RGB. So this pattern was designed to tell you. So if you saw, I think it clipped in white, but not in the colors, that told you it was clipping in YCBCR because all those colors, even though they go up to 254 or 1019 in this case, uh, the YCBCR are actually all within the nominal range of 64 and 940 and 960 for chroma. So little things like that. Uh, thank you for the super chat. Uh, we talked about this earlier. Um, keep it in the DCI-P3 or auto setting for more accuracy. Let's go to resolution. So this is another extension or an, a change from the previous disk. So the previous disc, I think we just had a couple chroma patterns. This one, we've added a lot more. And so for example, we didn't have the primaries and secondaries in, uh, so if we switch to like a zone plate, this will be kind of messy, but. And yeah, then I'm go to see what this looks like in the stream. Go to chroma, yeah, do that one. So if you play this pattern, uh, you'll see how the, well, at least on the streaming, the left and right sides of the image are darker than the center. So I don't know if that's what you're seeing there as well. Uh, yeah, it's a little darker, uh, but the video is, or the camera's adding more yeah. circles along the way. 
Yeah. So, uh, but here I'm just looking for the dimness. So it should be equal yeah. brightness across the entire frame. And on LG, for example, uh, it looks, you know, kind of like what I'm seeing streaming. Unless you put it into 444 mode, then the brightness is equal across the entire frame. And so this pattern is 420, so it should not be impacted at all between 422 and 444, which tells me there's conversions, multiple conversions up and down, and they're not great. So by putting it in 444, you bypass all that and you get equal brightness. So you maintain all the resolution. Now in Dolby Vision on this pattern, the very far left and far right are black and white. They're filtering the color out. Hmm. So. Yeah, I mean, it's it's dimmer on the left and right, but it's yeah. not as bad as what it's of yeah. what you're seeing. But it should not be dimmer in the end. It should be equal brightness all the way across. So the edges are where it's higher frequency, higher resolution. Are more detail and so that's what's getting filtered out and we added like i said we added red green blue cyanogen into yellow to this and i think the layout was different on the last disc this time we organized it based on the radio buttons and so it, you can go through and i think it's cleaner this way because okay. before yeah. i think we put all of them on screen at once so when you press the right arrow on the last multi-burst pattern it would start playing the wedge patterns from the beginning this mm -hmm. does not do that it stays on whichever one you've selected Uh, kind of an off-topic question here, but for the media uh, streaming devices, do you recommend the Apple TV and to use RGB High with it? So I use YCBCR444, and I have two Apple TVs. Okay. Um, because yeah, so, I've seen a lot of comments about the, that can cause a green tint and to use RGB High. I've never seen that, and I don't have any green tint. So the problem with RGB is the first thing the TV is going to do is convert it back to YCBCR and down to 422. So you, you never really, I mean, RGB on a consumer television will always get color converted to YCBCR. On a computer monitor, they they don't do that. They stay RGB. So I haven't seen the screen tint. Um, yeah, Maybe there's an ABS thread about it. But, okay. Yeah. yeah, so I have the new Apple TV 4K that has the uh, USB-C connector, and I have the previous one with the lightning connector. Yep. Yeah, and I've noticed, um, going back to the apps, uh, Paramount Plus converted Dolby Vision content to hdr 10 plus for displays that support it but the ones that do um the black levels are completely raised like even the black bars are gray so i don't have hdr 10 plus so i don't see that mm -hmm. that's interesting but the nice thing about having the apple tv is it has hdr whereas if you play the same thing built the app built into the tv there is no hdr at least on the the lg that i have Mm -hmm. So the Apple TV is a must on Paramount Plus if you want HDR. Like yeah, for same the Star thing. Trek series. SDR for Paramount Plus if you use the built-in app on the Samsung. Using the Apple TV, even if you disable 10 Plus and just try to watch an HDR 10, it's the same thing, raised blacks. Interesting. I'm surprised they're doing that and no one has uh, is that concerns. A, is that there's a, concerns on AVS, but... Well, well, I, I, I mean, I mean, from a, a branding perspective, you're saying yeah. it converts Dolby Vision to HDR 10 plus. Anything that they had available in Dolby Vision, they now are offering in 10 plus. It's new. Oh, and sorry, I thought content... you meant that the the device was no, converting. No, no, no. No, not okay, that. Yeah, I just mean they okay. they've added it, and anything that was Dolby Vision now is available in 10 plus. But if you watch it on a Samsung, it's going to have raised blacks. So we don't know. What we don't know is if the raised blacks is caused by the Apple TV or by the display. But we do know someone at Apple who works in that area, and I will point that out to him. Okay. In fact, I I assume you're watching. So <laughs> <laughs> let's see um, what else could be different. Um, go to ramps. So we did change ramps a little bit this time around. Before we had a bunch of, well, it won't be on this disc because it's it's SDR, but we had a bunch of different tone mapping ramps and like RGB, Cyanogen into yellow. Mm -hmm. This time tone yep. mapping is only in white. And uh, those other versions are actually now a clipping pattern that's under uh, evaluation color on the HDR disc. Okay. So in the SDR, we only have stimulus and stimulus steps. So the steps are, you know, cross steps. On the HDR disc, we have stimulus, we have saturation ramps, and then we have tone mapping ramps. Now, we also changed the size. So on the SDR disc, these are a lot bigger because it's only 100 nits. On the HDR disc, that area of the ramp is actually limited to a 10% area window. That way, the very right tip would be as bright as the display would be if you measured a 10% window. At least that was the theory. So then what's with the Spears and Munzel round and dither? So... If you create a, a gradient in RGB, which is what you have to do, you convert it to YCBCR for, for you know transmission. You convert back to RGB, not every code value will round trip. 
So some code values, let's say you wanted to, I'm gonna make up a number, 235, it might come back as 234, 236. So you'll actually have inherent steps in, in the round. Uh, dither, you add a little bit of noise to it and you hide those steps. Well, the Spears and Munsell is our solution to that. By manipulate, so in the case of the green ramp, we can actually manipulate the code values of red and blue below black to actually get the green value to round trip correctly. We can only do it on the primaries, though it doesn't work on secondaries, which is why it'll switch to two. All right, and if anyone has any final questions, uh, let us know, because we are a bit past a scheduled time. Um, any final things you want to mention? Uh, I don't think I have any, and there's so much. Yeah. I'm so glad it's out there. I've seen uh, reviewers already using it and, uh, you know, knowing that it's going to uh, improve the quality of displays makes all the, all the, 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 I don't want to say stress, but the, the difficulty of getting the thing done, uh, it, it's, it makes it all worthwhile. Uh, we kind of mentioned this earlier when we were talking about Dolby Vision. Um, if you missed that earlier, the stream will stay up. So, but essentially, everybody wants to, to have it. Um, but, you know, I guess the question could be rephrased if your friend was looking for a new TV and you were advising them and so, they were looking at, say, an S95C and a G3, would Dolby Vision and HDR10 Plus play a factor in your recommendation? What I like specifically about LG is they give us the ability to actually do a 1D and 3D LUT calibration and to yeah. also create custom static tone curves for HDR. And my, uh, my LG C9 had a tone curve created to basically match uh, a Sony BVM monitor. So it looked very much like a Sony BVM. So this is a good example of a pattern to look at. So with, with some of our patterns, when we go from disc to disc, we actually make improvements. So on this pattern, uh, there's new elements on it compared to the last disc, and that's the black and white lines just outside the circle, above and below and to the sides. So all the horizontal and vertical edge transitions are single pixel on this pattern, except for those. We've added, uh, there's actually three pieces to it. The thinnest piece is a single pixel transition. The next one up is a 2T where there's actually a slight uh, roll off. And then uh, I, think it, I think it's T and 2T. Anyways, it's to, be more representative real world content that's not doesn't necessarily have instantaneous uh, rise times now all your diagonals and your circles are anti-alias so that's also more representative real world but that's horizontal and vertical uh, is the first time we've done this and same thing on the scaling pattern if you want to go to the scaling pattern i'll talk about that a bit some of the actually there's two things i want to show on that one let's go to the 239 version of the pattern Oh, it, you're on the right menu. Just go down to scaling 239. Okay. Do the uh, one to the left. Yeah, the full resolution one. So we have one at native resolution. So you see what the pattern should look like. And then we have one at HD resolution. We would have loved to have done 720p, but UHD Blu-ray doesn't support 720p. So on the very original version of this pattern, it didn't have the, the, blue, the red and blue color pieces. And it didn't have that. Um, it's actually a segment of the zone plate. We see, sort of see the moray moving through it above and below the black and white line, uh, black and white boxes. So the second edition didn't have those. Uh, what we found while developing the, the first HDR disc was not only could you get YC delay at native resolution, but there were some TVs that when you scale from HD to UHD also introduce YC delay. So we put those chroma diamonds on the pattern. We call them chroma diamonds because of the way they're shaped. We put those on the pattern to, to figure out if during scaling you have YC delay. So you'd look at the native resolution, see if there's YC delay using a loop, and then you'd go to the HD version and check it again. And if it moved or if it shifted, you know there's delay introduced from the scaling. Now on the, uh, the other parts, which is a segment from the zone plate, uh, Panasonic has a feature called Edge. And on this test pattern, when you enable it, the little black and white steps, they get ringing on the HD version when scaled to UHD. When you turn on the edge pattern, it actually gets rid of that ringing, which is great. So it's like an anti-ringing filter. However, there was a user on the Blu-ray forum that reported when he turned edge on, it actually introduced Moray in Venetian blinds in the first Captain America movie. So we wanted to reproduce that and I put up a zone plate and the zone plate actually had that effect. So we cut out that section of the zone plate and we put it on this pattern. So as yeah. we... 
It was Jeff. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You saw the thread today, probably. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we look at user feedback and we make changes to patterns based on feedback as we go to the you know the mm -hmm. next iteration of the pattern. Now, oh. press the sub. Turn on subtitles. I was just going to say, do they now put the subs yet? Yeah. Uh, do, do, do. Panasonic hides it behind the <laughs> sub menu. I think you have to press options. I think in the Panasonic remote. Bottom left of the default. <laughs> yeah. uh, you can tell I work these okay. things. Uh, yeah. And, um, this pattern alone. Um, is it this pattern alone stays through? Do we put them in any others? Just the two, just the two two three nine patterns. So go yeah. down. I guess the subtitle settings down arrow. Yeah. Go down one. And then subtitle on. There you okay. go. Now, uh, go ahead and uh, well chapter. I just leave it where it's at. So there are three subtitle, three rows of subtitles. Row one overlays the image and the black area. Row two, black area. Row three, black area. They turn on, I think, every 10 seconds, and then they turn off every 10 seconds. And this was added for advanced video processors and people using uh, like a 239 screen. The idea, like for example, the Mad VR Envy, it will fill the 239 screen, but as soon as subtitles come on, they'll actually zoom out so you can see the subtitle area. And so in this case, it will zoom multiple times in and out. It was used for testing that feature on a display. Okay. We always author uh, subtitles so they sit inside the active picture area. I would hope everyone else is too. Oh, and, I've uh, seen them in no. Those are, there are there are movies that I'll put them in the black bars. All right. Yeah. It's gonna be a nightmare for projector owners. With come with the 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 fixed width screens like the two three nine. But of course, I think a lot of players. I remember first the player manufacturers were uh, not really willing to implement it, but uh, a lot of players have the subtitle shift feature now. Can you go down uh, the variable checkerboard? So this is a new one. And the, so if you look at an LCOS projector, it cannot resolve single pixel checkerboards. Like the, one of the pixel gets bigger, the other pixel gets smaller. And I wasn't sure if it was just single pixel or if it's certain pixel sizes. So I wanted to build a pattern that would actually start with giant pixels, you know, big transitions. And slowly as you go out, uh, they would get smaller and smaller. And so in the corners on this pattern, it's actually single pixel. This way you can kind of look at an LCOS and see where, the, uh, where that occurs. Now, if you press the right arrow, we'll go to the inverse of this pattern where the single pixels are in the center. And the color you see, like the color you see at least through uh, streaming, that doesn't exist in the pattern. It's pure black and white. Mm -hmm. And then well, in the color- Aside it, from the fringing. <laughs> yes, aside from the fringing. Oh, this is the, yeah. Yeah, cutie one. So I'm just, I'm seeing the red on top of each black box. <laughs> so I don't see any red uh, on yeah, the black the boxes the streaming. Yeah, the camera won't. I would That's have to good. get really close with the camera for- <laughs> Yeah, I'm sitting within arm's reach of it, so. Yeah. And if you want to go to the color eval section, we can show the color version. So the color version, instead of making two big versions, I think we just did one, or we put uh, the primaries and secondaries all in one pattern, but it's sort of an illusion. Yeah, so go to variable checkerboard. I don't, it's one of these two. Okay, so it's the, so right now you see six distinct boxes, right? Mm -hmm. You've got red, and the order we put the boxes in, so to make yellow, it's a mixture of red and green, which is why yellow is in that corner like that. It's sort of the order we put the patterns. Uh, now press the right arrow, and this is where you're going to see sort of a, your eye is going to shift. So now you might actually shift to the two in the center, but really it's still the, the three across the top and three across the bottom. But the one in the center sort of mimics the previous pattern. The way your eye is drawn to it. All right, so let's go back to the menu. Is the color clipping? Go to uh, clipping code value. I think this, okay, yeah. So on this one, you'll notice there's two magentas. And what I wanted to do was basically, you know, you'll see the R where it's got the, the three colors together and the, the blue and the green, that's telling you which colors have that color in it. So yellow and cyan have green in it. Red has uh, red is in magenta and yellow and blue is in green and magenta. So I just thought that was just another way to do it. And that, you, know, you can't really see it on the display, but inside each one of these color boxes is this sort of modulation ramp that runs to the center of it. And it's, what you're looking for is where that ramp stops. And that's kind of where it clips. 
And in this case, being SDR, if you're preserving head and toe room, it should go all the way up to 1019. If it's clipping, every, if it's clipping, it'll probably clip at 940. If you're not preserving head and toe room. And on this one, we also added, so we had the chrome alignment before and we added chrome alignment HD. The original reason we added it in HD is because you don't need a loop. The, uh, when you scale it up, the lines are fatter and easier to see, but that's where we also ran into the scaling artifact. So not this one, but press the right arrow. So this is the native UHD resolution. And if you press the right arrow, you go to the HD version that gets scaled up, which makes all those lines thicker. So this is actually easier to see, but this is also where we found out that scaling introduces YC delay on some displays. So. Hey, your, I thought your phone died there, David. I'm still here. Yeah. So. Anyways, right. I, if there's any other questions or anybody else has any questions, I, mean, I think we've actually um, covered a lot. Yeah, not seeing much. Um, let's see. All right, that question was answered by someone else. And you've been using the peak, are you still using the peak luminance pattern? Yeah. Yep. Have you started using the PCA pattern at all as well on the displays? Uh, the first one I'm going to do it on is the QN95C, um, which I have to take out of the box and get set up. So, uh, And I sent you the yeah. spreadsheet already, right? Uh, maybe not. Okay. I don't I recall. Can yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that's pretty much going to cover it. Um, yeah, I don't see any more questions right now there's someone in the chat asking what displays we all use and i think the bottom the the end of the the, the conclusion is we all use lg OLEDs, right <laughs> well so, they are right, the so that's biggest, something they are the biggest monitor to use you know except all colorists have that as a client monitor so exactly yep. yeah. yeah so with the a95l coming out this year um they switched to the new pentonic chip and so that technically has support with Calman um, that previously they didn't. The question is, is Sony going to use all of that support? But potentially, there could be a lot of support on that. Okay. Um, also, with the A95K, you could disable the tone mapping, but then it would over-track EOTF. Then you could lower peak luminance to medium. It would track EOTF, but be at 500 nits instead of 1,000. They're claiming double luminance with the A95L. Potentially, it could go 1,000 nits, hard clip, tone mapping off, um, and be a viable option for an external LED. So that's where, again, I'm using a Mad VR Envy. So mm -hmm. even with uh, an LG, I can create a curve that tracks EQ, that tracks PQ and hard clips. So then mm -hmm. I do all the tone mapping in the Envy itself, mm -hmm. which has uh, exceptional tone mapping and great chroma upscaling, great scaling, AI based. So it's probably, yeah. I consider it to be the best video processor available, but it's also not mm -hmm. affordable. Yeah. The, the well, with your solution, um, I'm assuming you have some way of correcting with HDR uh, low color saturation, because that is an issue with the G3, um, and a matrix slot doesn't do anything to help it. Um, on... Well, you can't with with uh, the with with the Mad VR. You can do what a thirty three thousand, mm -hmm. the thirty three cube LUT, or maybe even a sixty five mm -hmm. cube LUT. So you got a lot of fine control. Yep. Um, Yes, yeah, so, but outside of that, uh, for me, the reason I didn't go with the G3 was the low saturation and HDR issue and the uniformity. Um, the seeing, if you have a QD OLED next to any of the LGs and you put up anything that's going to show uniformity problems, it's night and day. Now, uh, with the Samsung, can I put it in native gamut and have it hard clip, turn off tone mapping completely? It's, you can set it to static, so whatever the static tone mapping is, but not hard clip. That's what Expand. I'm saying with the Sony. Okay. There's potentially, you know, we don't know how bright it's actually going to be. They're claiming double. But I know on the A95K, if you turned off the tone mapping and set the peak luminance so that it would track EOTF, you could get a little around 500 nits. So if they were to double it, you potentially on the new one could get a 1,000 nit hard clip. But can I turn off all the processing? I guess, do I have to use, is there any? In graphics mode. <laughs> yeah. So if I can get the, you know, an NV to work in graphics mode on that, again, I do all the color processing mm -hmm. in the NV and hopefully mm -hmm. get a great image. Yeah. And again, hopefully um, that they'll actually support more stuff with Calman and have HDR tone map uploads and things like that as well. 
Yeah, so what I what I always like to joke about is there's no perfect technology. You got to find the one that bothers you the least. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So. 100%. Uh, yeah, it's like for for me, like I said, it's the uniformity um, problems that. Yeah. I decided to go with QD OLED. Well, if we could get LG to expose the uniformity calibration, and Calman yeah. can add it into the consumer display like it's in the Pro display they have, then mm -hmm. you could correct that. Yep. Yeah. So. But you know, that's the problem is, oh, this new display is coming. Hey, but this next one's got this feature, so I'm going to wait till it. Oh, but wait, I hear there's a new feature in the next one. So you just keep waiting forever. At some point, you just mm -hmm. got to buy one, live with it, and be happy. Yeah. I What's remember up for me, the I... uh, Projector Central article, I think it was years ago, that said, like, whatever you buy, don't have buyer's remorse, because whatever you get is going to be so much better than what you could get 10 years ago. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think that tracks. So. so I remember when I got my first laser disc player. Uh, and I just lusted over the Ferrugia LD100 line doubler, which was $15,000 and I couldn't afford it. And that mm -hmm. only converted 480i to 480p. So I remember the day we forgot progressive scan DVD players and there was all this concern about getting a progressive signal out. Then they came out with scaling DVD players and there was all this, all of that's moot now because we have Blu-ray, UHD Blu-ray. They're so much better than DVD ever was. Mm -hmm. the, so. the weird, the, the sad thing about DVD was, I mean, just, Every single title, more or less, was low pass filtered. They just had sub SD resolution. And I also, because I'm originally from the UK, so many titles encoded for the PAL countries uh, were always encoded interlaced. The progressive flag wasn't set, which really um, kind of hamstrung what the encoder could do. Because encoding two uh, uh, pairs of fields is uh, a lot more wasteful than just encoding a progressive yeah. image. So, so things are so much better now. So before DVD was selected, the format that we have with Toshiba, you know, there was the, the shootout between Sony and Toshiba. And one of the key factors that got Toshiba to win was a guy named Andrew Rosen, who worked at GDMX at the time, which was Warner Brothers. He had built a little circuit board that did inverse telecine. So they encoded, they did their encode with the progressive frame flags. And they, you know, got good encoding, whereas Sony did not. And they encoded as interlaced. And in the shootout, the Toshiba, the, the Warner Brothers demo won. Wow. Yeah. So, you know. These old format war stories are so interesting to me. Do you remember the whole um, thing with um, Philips wanted MPEG audio to be the choice for DVD in the PAL countries only? And I think this is like a sort of, I think someone in a committee somewhere threw them this bone, like, you know, sorry, we adopted the Toshiba system mainly, but you can still have your audio codec in there. And it's interesting what happened because the web pages are still online. Um, what basically happened there was that. Um, uh, Dolby's brand name was so strong and it's home, home cinema enthusiasts in Europe were already used to AC3 soundtracks and Laserdisc that when they were told, well, actually, you know, you're, you're going to get a different system to the NTSC countries. They were, they were like, what? No, <laughs> we want, we want the Dolby version. And that's how that's, it's real. It, it is. It, I wonder if I'm surprised. Well, I'm not surprised, but it, you could make a case for analyzing that whole thing in, in like your business schools for the, just the power of a brand name. And of course, each site, each, each site claimed that their system had, you know, things that the other didn't. Um, but uh, it, it's it's so fascinating all the stuff that just gets forgotten at the time. So since you're from Europe and you do authoring, what? So one of the things obviously people want that we don't support are PAL frame rates. But what are the mm -hmm. PAL frame rates allowed on 4K Blu-ray? You know, um, it would have to be 25 and 50. But I've not authored a single title that way. Okay, um, even for Europe. I've, yeah, I mean, we're dealing almost exclusively with stuff that was shot in film, which goes on disc at 23.98. And I hear every so often, I hear cinematographers say, oh, you shouldn't be using um, the integer frame rates. You should be using, you know, 24 flat. But, you know, as you said, the Xboxes can't play it correctly. And also the reason that we still use 23.98, other than that, is um, very rarely, um, most of the clients I work with are doing DVD. But sometimes we'll get asked to author a DVD version, and it makes no that doesn't support 24. So it makes a lot more sense to use the same Dolby Digital audio commentary or the same subtitle timing uh, across all formats. Um, the, the, the difference between 2398 and 24 is like three yeah. or four seconds over the running time of the film. So it's not a, not a major concern. So, and the Xbox is really, I think it's much less used as a video player than say Apple TV, because Apple TV right. for a long time, right? Netflix would have 24 native 24 shows and Apple TV only played at 2398. Because I remember Chris I Deering know. was, oh yeah, there was, a, I think there's threads on AVS about that. I believe that's been fixed, but that was a big issue for a long time. Something somewhat related. Um, 
when I had the uh, G3 here, and I have an NVIDIA Shield as well, which has match frame rate in beta, but it doesn't work on anything. Um, <laughs> so using that, uh, moved the shield to the G3, um, and it's you know set to 60 hertz, and using cinema screen on the G3, which should be 3-2 pull down, I noticed immediate uh, soap opera effect just from that without you know the true motion being on. Um, whereas on the Apple TV with the match frame rate, it's fine for me, and, and I can't stand any soap opera effect smoothing or anything like that. I have an old Vizio TV. It's like a 32-inch, and it has 3D support, so I'll always keep it. But I remember watching Big Bang Theory on it, and it almost had a soap opera effect. But this TV didn't have that feature. And what it, what you're looking at is the way the LCD overdrives the pixel to reduce blur. That gives you a similar effect. And it breaks beyond the boundaries of the actual frames and the content. Natural motion smoothing. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Only not. All right. Well, uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, thank you, uh, Stacey and David, everyone prior for joining. And it's been a, a fun stream. And uh, what I might do is go through and uh, crop out some segments for individual videos in the future from this. But I will leave the entire stream up as well. Okay. So well, thank you for having us. Really appreciate yes, it. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, and again, everybody, the link for the new disc uh, is in the description of the stream. Um, and that goes to biasliding.com, which is Media Light. And they also have you know, the D65 bias lighting, light bulbs, and other things there that you can look at while you're on their site. And so. biasliding.com or Media Light, Jason, he's actually the official distributor of the disc. Okay. All right. So. Thank you, everybody, and uh, I will see you all again in a stream soon. All right. Bye. Have a good one. You.